uh, for the first intake of graduate students next year. Um, that agreement has to be welcomed um, in terms of the uh, future fund package also. Um, so the progress of the medical school is now critical and um, for the city and the district and the fact that it's now um, with the uh, executive office will go some way now to ensuring that um, this area will be looked after in terms of the medical school and that we do have those young medical graduates and takes happening and ready for, for next year. So I just wanted to welcome that. I also uh, want to uh, offer my sincere condolences uh, to all of those who have died recently uh, within our city and district, um, particularly those who died of COVID-19. Uh, I want to offer my sincere sympathies to the families. I also want to offer my sympathy to the family of Philomena Dodi. Uh, Philomena was the mother of uh, Malachi, Mal Dodi, who we all know. Mal uh, works within the mayor's office. And Philomena was also the mother of a former councillor, uh, Sharon Dodi. So our condolences to the Dodi family at this time. Uh, I also want to offer my condolences to the family of uh, uh, MLA John Dallet. Um, John, who died uh, during the week, was a member of the SDLP party. John and I work very closely together uh, within the assembly. Um, myself as chair of the public accounts committee and, 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 and I worked with John very, very well. I was very fond of John. We had a very good working relationship. Um, and we also had a very great personal relationship as well too. He was a great friend of mine. Even when I left the assembly, we still kept in touch and, and he was still very much a, a friend, a friend to everybody and, a, and an excellent MLA. And he will be sorely missed. And um, I'm sure not just within his own family, but within the wider circle um, of friends and families uh, across uh, East Derry. I also want to offer my condolences to the, uh, Colm Joyce's family. Also, Colm, everyone knew Colm. He was very instrumental in the strengthening of the real link to Derry. He uh, worked tirelessly on this piece of work. Uh, so I want to uh, offer my condolences to Colm's family also on, on the death of uh, their dearly departed brother, Colm. Uh, members, um, I also want to raise um, uh, an issue that has been raised with me during the week. Um, Councillor uh, Philip McKinney um, has asked me to um, consider the freedom of the city for, for our health workers and all of our frontline workers. Um, and I know that's a piece of work that has been worked up within Council. So I would ask Council um, if they could at this time um, I maybe to propose that they do that work uh, following on from this meeting, if they would start to do that piece of work. Uh, I, as mayor of the city, had also asked uh, for council um, looking to do a piece of work around um, our frontline and key health workers during this pandemic um, to ensure that they all of our frontline workers are all taken into consideration when we are paying a tribute to them and recognising the work that they're doing at this very difficult time. So um, uh, I would propose that Council um, do that piece of work in relation to looking at how we do that and what that would entail and um, take that piece of work forward from here on. Um, so I do know and I appreciate uh, Council Philip McKinney uh, spoke to me at length in relation to that, but uh, others as well and also um, put the proposal forward to myself as well also. So um, so uh, that's a piece of work under Chair's business if, if everybody's in agreement uh, um, to do. Okay, Mayor, member. Mayor, could I have a second for that proposal? Yes. Yeah. I don't know. Um, thank you, Philip. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. Okay, members. Um, moving on. Um, item five. 
uh, members COVID-19 briefing. Uh, I'll hand over to you, John. Thank you, Mayor. And if I could ask uh, Paul Jackson uh, to perhaps upload the presentation, if possible. Thank you. Uh, if we go to the first slide, please. Um, following our last Thursday, um, the Local Government Flexibility of District Council regulations came into force uh, the following day, uh, the 1st of May, um, which provides uh, councils uh, with the ability to hold uh, full council meetings with remote attendance, hence um, this meeting today. It also um, enables the public um, to access these meetings through remote means and, again, um, adding my welcome to those members of the public who may be viewing this afternoon. Um, additionally, members, it uh, affords councils, those councils who wish um, to uh, move their AGMs um, with the proviso that they are held by the 30th of September. Um, so members, the considerations uh, for us today, and it was raised last week, um, at this stage, we would be suggesting to you um, that you continue as normal with the AGM on Monday, the 1st of June at 7 p.m. And uh, following that, um, from the following day, we would reinstate um, the committees, starting as always with the Governance and Strategic Planning Committee on Tuesday, the 2nd of June and all of the other normal committees scheduled in the normal dates um, throughout the month of June. At this stage, members, um, it is um, given where we currently sit with the restrictions, uh, we would be suggesting all of those meetings uh, were remote. Uh, however, um, uh, time um, will pass quite quickly and hopefully things might change and there may be the possibility that some of those meetings um, might be able to take place physically and in a socially distanced manner, depending uh, on where the regulations sit at this time. And I would be suggesting members that even though committees are reinstated um, in the month of June, that um, as we still be uh, in an emergency period, that we would continue to hold full council briefings um, on a regular basis. Um, perhaps once a week, or depending on the situation, uh, drop those to once a fortnight. But I think it's I think it's very valuable in respect of all of the issues to be dealt with during the emergency um, that um, full council briefings continue to be held. So moving to the slides, and I'll ask Alfie Mayor to come in on those, please. Um, thank you, John. Um, members, obviously, following on from last week, the finance situation is obviously critical across the 11 councils. And at last week's meeting, you'll recall that a detailed overview was provided more at a regional and high level. And what today um, is doing is really bringing that to the next level in terms of the specific implications for council in this financial year. Um, so you'll see, see in the slide a table. Um, highlighting those various categories of impact and the initial estimate of those. So you'll be aware, members, three categories of cost that we're currently or loss that we're currently incurring. Firstly, is the very significant income loss from our closure of services and facilities. Second is pressures around waste management, and third is um, a, a range of items of emergency expenditure that we're having to incur during the pandemic. Um, last week, it was advised those were around 700K per month. Members, it's obviously difficult to know how long that will continue for, depending on um, the restrictions. Um, but um, at this point, we need to forecast that that will cost us circa 8 million this year um, as a planning assumption. The second key element um, is the estimated rate base impact. Again, members, that's difficult to quantify, but based on Two assumptions around the impact and non-domestic rate base of 25% um, for the remaining nine months of the financial year, and a potential hit to our domestic rate base. Again, members, uh, planning assumption around that could cost us up to seven million. So those two items, um, members, come to a very significant total. Obviously, of 15 million. 
Um, what we have to set against that at this point in time is all the usable reserves have been reviewed, our district fund, our, our provisions, and we have about six and a half million um, in that regard. <laughs> Um, we have um, the support grant has not been cut as um, was advised um, last week, so there's a small saving there. And the remaining item at our disposal, um, you'll be aware that we normally have in year capital savings, um, which we use in year to progress other capital projects. So um, after a number of things that have been ring fenced against that, that would provide about 1.8 million. So. Potentially, members, that's looking at a financial loss of net of six and a half million um, for council in this financial year. Again, obviously, a very significant figure, and that loss would, at that point, our district fund would be totally eliminated going into next year's um, rates. Members, that doesn't include um, any financial implications of the subsequent report in relation to the waiver of burial fees, and that will be considered in the next item. Um, so, just moving on to the next slide, um, Paul, please. Um, members, just in respect of obligations in relation to when we do um, encounter financial um, difficulties as we are in the minute, there are three specific <laughs> obligations set out in the Finance Act as number one. We need to advise council that our reserves are or are likely to be inadequate, um, and that's what the previous slide has effectively set out. The reasons for that are obviously um, due to the pandemic, and the third key item is that we need to advise of appropriate actions to prevent those reserves continuing to be inadequate going into next financial year. So, effectively, members, that's the key point that I'll focus on for the remaining two slides. What have we done, and what are we um, going to require to do um, in, in the coming weeks? Um, so, moving on to the next slide, Paul, please. Um, in terms of what has been done, members, you'll be aware the, of the regional proposal that has been submitted to government um, by the 11 councils, of which um, our bid is part of that for was 2.7 million, and that was for the losses incurred in the first um, quarter of the financial year, and it does not uh, include any impact on the rate base, um, which um, obviously needs to be kept under close review as well. Um, the specific asks of government are number one, cash in, in intervention for the losses that we're incurring. Um, number two is a range of other mitigation mem uh, um, uh, mitigation measures. Obviously, each council is very different and will require specific um, specific items to enable their own particular situation to be um, managed. And finally, members, the last request is that um, some sort of underwrite is, prevented, is provided to councils in relation to any loss of, of rates income. Um, members, councils are obviously uniquely funded from a central, from a government perspective. 80% of our income is rates, 20% of our income is service income. And of our costs or staff, so it is really critical members that government funding is secured, and in that respect, um, a briefing is being provided by councils to the communities committee next week um, to hopefully further um, consider that bid that has been submitted. Um, in the first instance, members, there's been a very clear direction from government that they would expect us to reduce that bid through um, the furlough scheme, um, so we won't get 2.7 million. It'll be um, an element of that with us expected to maximise what we can under the furlough scheme, so Paula will talk about that on the next slide. And finally, members, in relation to regional, the airport funding was obviously announced last Friday, um, 1.05 million. Um, that means that effectively the, the costs of the airport are being entirely covered for the first quarter of the financial year. So that currently is not worsening the 6.5 million position. Um, final slide, Paul, please. Um, so moving on to members, obviously the local measures that we'll need to consider, and we are considering in great detail as officers at the minute. Um, the top of the slide provides some context. Um, our gross expenditure budget is about 75 million. 47% of that is staff costs. So um, that that is, as you're aware, staff are obviously being continued to be paid. So the savings there, members, are minimal other than furlough and season and external recruitment. 11% of our cost members are waste contracts. And again, um, those have actually gone up and we've accounted for that in the six and a half million loss. 
a range of our costs, our premises costs, vehicles, insurance rates that we, we can't really do anything about, their fixed costs that we need to um, absorb. So in terms of the focus in relation to rectifying our <laughs> financial position members, it's in relation to the last two categories, is the only um, real areas that we can focus on. So capital loan charges, obviously a good element of that has been committed, although a lot of projects have not yet commenced and we're currently reviewing that. And finally, other program expenditure, all non-essential and discretionary expenditure has currently been ceased and a report will need to be brought to members once that review is completed in relation to um, what we may not um, be able to um, go ahead with in terms of program spend this year. Obviously, members, that, in, that involves very difficult um, decisions um, given the gravity of the overall financial impact. And that will be the next um, phase of the financial report. Members, more detailed considerations around that. Thank you. Thank you, Alfie. Mayor, members, just and uh, just to add to that, the eleven council chief executives and representatives from the finance officers, including Alfie, um, met with the Department for Communities yesterday, um, and that meeting the permanent secretary of the Department for Communities. As you know, uh, members, as Alfie has said, we have collectively uh, submitted a bid uh, to the department uh, for the first three months of the loss that we project we will incur uh, up to the end of June. Collectively, uh, that's a bid of 40 million pounds. Um, the Department for Communities have been, been very supportive um, of this bid and they have in turn submitted uh, a bid to the Department of Finance and uh, we're advised that the uh, Minister for Communities is very supportive and understanding of the local government situation. However, um, we were advised in the call yesterday um, that the current situation is that the uh, quantum of bids that have been submitted by various sources um, vastly exceeds um, the money that's available. So somewhere in the region of one billion pounds of bids have been submitted to the Department of Finance, um, with currently just short of 100 million pounds available uh, to meet those bids. So at this stage, members, it's highly unlikely um, that the totality of the bid that has been submitted by councils um, will be met in full, albeit there is considerable support and as we understand it, the executive is also um, making a further bid to the Treasury uh, for monies to, to meet um, the very considerable uh, bids that have been submitted to it. Um, so as we stand at the moment, members, as we reflected last Thursday, and we'll continue to do so um, in each of the meetings, um, we do uh, face uh, a, an extremely uh, challenging um, situation in the weeks and months ahead. So one of the potential mitigations that Alfie has mentioned and has been discussed in some of our briefings to date is the furloughing of staff. And I'm going to now pass to uh, Paula in respect of that because we did seek clarification and received clarification um, a few days ago um, that councils can now indeed um, seek to, to furlough relevant staff. So Paula, over to yourself, please. And next slide, please, Paul. Thank you, John. Um, as John has said, um, we got confirmation this week that councils can avail of the job retention scheme and therefore can furlough staff. So the job um, retention scheme um, enables employers to temporarily lay off staff and apply for a grant that covers 80% of their usual um, wage cost, up to £2,500 per month, plus any associated employer cost. So, since receiving that confirmation at the beginning of the week, um, we have been consulting with the trade unions in relation to some of the principles of following that we want to progress. And at this stage, we propose following in the region of 200 employees, and that includes those employees um, that are currently shielding or because they are because they are vulnerable and unable to work from home. But the main bulk of those employees would be our employees within leisure services, because obviously our leisure centres are closed, and employees within um, museum services and the Alley Theatre and the Guildhall. 
Now, at this stage, we're not, we wouldn't be proposing for one all those employees because some of them are, have been redeployed across other critical services. But at this stage, we've identified um, 200 employees that we could furlough right away. So in relation to some of the principles of the furloughing, what we would be proposing doing, while we can only um, claim 80% of um, their costs, we would be proposing furloughing these employees at 100% of their pay. And they would be furloughed on their current terms and conditions of employment, so they wouldn't be at any detriment. And um, we would be proposing um, furloughing them right away and um, keeping it under review. You know, so initially you follow for a minimum of three weeks, but we would be constantly looking at our service needs and um, reviewing it in line with that. So over, we are aiming and have been trying to make telephone contact with all those employees that we would propose following, and then we will follow up um, with letters um, which outlines the scheme and really uh, and is very specific about the terms and conditions and um, of of the follow scheme. So basically, that that's that. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Um, and obviously, members, there's been quite a bit of, uh, in the press this week. A few other councils uh, have moved within the last day or two to uh, do something similar, and all of the rest um, will probably move in the next day or so uh, to do the same. We're at pains, members, this week to uh, most people already understand the furloughing scheme, but we are at pains to make sure that we communicate the staff um, that there is absolutely no change to their terms or conditions, that they remain uh, fully employed uh, by the council, um, that this is a temporary measure that has been put in place by government. And that certainly it is the view of this council that um, they will um, suffer absolutely no financial detriment um, during this period, it is simply a mechanism that has been put in place to enable us uh, to recoup some of the cost. It has to be said, members, that um, we there is no guarantee of success in respect of this. Um, the legislation and the guidance um, is not absolute. We will, uh, subject to your views today, make application immediately to Treasury uh, to furlough the staff that we think may be eligible. But Treasury will, uh, in, in all likelihood, uh, challenge uh, some of that, and uh, we may not be able to uh, furlough all of those staff that we have uh, put forward for furloughing. We have been advised that the, um, the, the only category that will be considered are those that are linked directly to an income source, which is why we are going down the route of leisure services, alley, museum services, that type of thing. Uh, but we do expect um, some challenge with regard to um, the list that we put up. Um, so we are advising that um, this is not a fait accompli. Um, it's simply an attempt to do what we can to offset cost. Um, we've also been advised, members, in our discussions with DFC yesterday, um, that their bid to central government on our behalf does not include the 20% that um, the council in all likelihood would wish to make up. Um, they have not included that. I specifically ask that that is brought to the minister's attention, that the DFC bid to the Department of Finance does not include the 20% and the officials uh, undertook to, to do that. So um, thank you, Paula. And moving to the next section, uh, community support, Karen McFarland, please, Mayor. Uh, Mayor, members, um, I just want to give you a brief um, update um, of activity within the uh, Health and Community Directorate. Um, so you'll see that 1,340 um, individuals have sought support um, through the COVID hub, and we'll, uh, we will continue to receive referrals for pharmacy, fuel, social contact, and those individuals referred to us by the Western Trust. We've been helped and assisted by very strong participation from the community and voluntary sector, um, who are undertaking the last mile in terms of the delivery of food boxes. The strong communication networks established between our partners, uh, Council and the Western Trust, and this collaboration is greatly assisting us um, to, uh, to help individuals uh, who require support beyond um, food boxes. Um, from food banks uh, through collection and delivery services, for example. 
you will know that DSC have a wider support role in regard to vulnerable people. They are reviewing that process um, at this particular point in time, and we're contributing to that um, so that learning can be taken forward. Um, and you will have seen this week that there are other initiatives coming through, such as the launch of the priority for home delivery slots uh, to shielded individuals. The community fund allocated and managed by the ACORN Foundation, um, the initial investment of 50000 by Council, has supported at this stage up to um, the value of £2,500, uh, 20 local groups. Additionally, grants of up to 10000 were available from the wider Coronavirus Emergency Fund, which is administered by CFNI. A total of 201000 has been awarded from this fund to groups. Donors to this fund include the Department for Communities, Comic Relief, the Ulster Garden Villages, National Emergency Trust and the Bank of Ireland. This fund is still open to receive applications, although the overall grant funding is now significantly reduced at this stage of the emergency. Port NI over recent years has given council um, funding um, 72k thousand investment last year with an in-year lift of 46,000. So that's a total of 118,000 to administer a small grants programme. In light of the very strong demand um, on the hardship fund, Sport and I now wish to deliver that fund directly. We anticipate um, that um, approximately 25 clubs have benefited to date. There are further 500 applications from across Northern Ireland in Sport NI systems, which are yet to be assessed. So this scheme is now closed. Sport and I are also leading discussions with governing bodies around plans for the resumption of sport. Um, proposals are being developed by various bodies, such as soccer, and we have seen um, the FAI proposal um, in relation to Derry City, Gaelic games, water-based sports, angling, equestrian activities, and mountaineering, for example. So council officers will shortly engage in these discussions, which have a strong focus on performance and competition, to address issues around the use of council facilities. Our officer team remain available to support um, the community voluntary sector, um, and uh, we are using our web platform www.derrystraban.com forward slash community support. That is being updated daily um, in relation to um, items relating to recruitment keeping children safe, resources to stay healthy, child-friendly information, um, which includes the Young Social Innovators Scheme. So I'd ask you members to keep abreast of that. Uh, we're also trying to support the sector um, with access to additional grant funding. So we have 13 staff and 26 groups who have undertaken grant finder training. And there's a further session planned for next week, which has um, additional availability. And you should later this evening um, receive um, an email um, advising you of that opportunity. Members, there's one final issue that emerged since the slides were prepared um, earlier today. Um, you will be aware that the crisis intervention service contract with Extern, following an agreed extension um, to that contract, ends in June 2020. You will also recall that Council agreed to request that the Department of Health fund the service going forward. So following representations to the department and very protracted discussions um, ongoing until Monday of this week with existing funders, um, including the Health and Social Care Board, the Public Health Agency, the Trust and Foil Rescue, we also have spoken and included to the Department of Health, the Department of Justice and the Department of Communities um, in those discussions. There is no commitment to future funding um, at this stage. And the Department of Health have advised that they cannot solely fund this service. As such, I'm just bringing to your attention that this service will end at the conclusion of the contracted period. Um, Extern has uh, been um, a very successful delivery partner, and we know the discussions will ongo um, in relation to other potential sources of funding, such as big lottery. Um, but those will be for services which will need to be procured. Um, and taken forward by a delivery partner uh, beyond um, the contract that the council currently manage. So, members, that concludes um, my input um, to the meeting this evening. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, and reinforcing, as always, members, um, the huge support uh, and continued support from a vast range of community and voluntary sector partners um, out there right across the council district who. To work very hard uh, to deliver all of these initiatives and indeed to work with 
Council and all parts of government who are trying to do the same. Moving on to the next slide, Paul, please. So for terms of purposes, um, we're in the very early stages of um, what we refer to as phase one operational recovery. Um, cemeteries, as you know, uh, reopened from Saturday the 25th of April, um, continued to be open every day, 2.30 to 9 o'clock, and closed in the morning for funerals and maintenance. Um, we're continuing to manage that very well, uh, and I think uh, members of the public uh, are, are uh, delighted that it has been reinstated and are content with the arrangements. In relation to waste, uh, Household Bucky Waste Collection Service was reinstated this week and is now uh, fully operational again. Uh, the COVID-19 waste helpline remains in place and we would propose um, would remain in place over the coming weeks. All of our domestic refuge collection services are fully operational and um, we have now put in place all preparations uh, for the phased reopening of household recycling centres as and when appropriate. Um, at this stage, uh, members, we have not received any direction from the executive office in terms of changes to the restrictions or regulations. Um, it had been um, admitted that there may be some um, direction in relation to that this week. Uh, a number of councils, uh, four councils, I think at this stage, are either partially or fully reopened, and one or two more councils may reopen in the coming days with uh, the remainder uh, advising that they will remain closed until there's clear direction from government. Uh, and I would be suggesting members that we are in that camp um, at this particular moment in time. Um, streetscape services in terms of street cleaning, grounds maintenance services, while not fully uh, back uh, at, at capacity, um, have certainly ramped up very considerably uh, over the last week or so and, uh, uh, and are almost wholly reinstated. Um, next slide, uh, Connor, uh, if Connor is on the line, will perhaps speak to um, the key principles around the reopening of recycling centres as and when um, we get some clear direction from the executive. Yeah, members, um, obviously um, there are a number of, of principles and guidelines that have been issued in terms of uh, what that should look like, and they're all guided by uh, safety. And that's both safety in terms uh, and well-being in terms of the staff and the users. Uh, so, with that in mind, they will reopen on a phase basis across a number uh, of locations, five locations, uh, and that's to ensure that we can implement social distancing, that we can manage uh, traffic safely and securely, uh, and all those arrangements are in place for the five sites that we have agreed to open at this stage. Uh, as part of that, there will be restricted numbers uh, on site at any one time. So, we will have a traffic management plan that will limit and have queuing systems in place so that uh, vehicles enter up onto uh, the waste uh, disposal areas uh, in sequence um, so that uh, you know, we avoid uh, members of the public coming into contact uh, with each other uh, as part of that and for the initial period and again these uh, this is this has been applied uniformly across uh, the region and indeed it's been applied across other the other uh, UK uh, uh, administrations as well is there will be uh, no vans or trailers for that initial period. Uh, we will focus on uh, three main waste streams, which is Blackburn residual waste, uh, excess blueburn waste, and uh, grass and hedge cuttings uh, for the initial period. Um, those in terms of um, the principles that have been put forward represent, if you want, uh, the bigger element of the waste and, and the more difficult to, to manage from a householder in terms of trying to store them um, within their property. Um, after the initial period, again, we will we will um, review this daily, and I can't say whether that would be you know for for a week, two weeks, but we will review it daily on the basis when we consider it safe and practical that we will extend the materials that we can take on site, and then we will look to open other locations, providing we can do so uh, again safely, and that's paramount and key to all of this. In terms of the sites that we're going to open, um, it will be Pennyburn, Glendermott, Strathfoyle, Claudie, and Strands Road. And again, members, I need to reiterate that that's on the basis that we can manage traffic securely. We can uh, manage uh, um, you know, the public on the site securely, ensure social distancing, permit contractors on site securely, and manage all of that, uh, uh, ensure safety at, at all times. All the sites will open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday to Friday, uh, 8 p.m. to 6 on a Saturday, 
and a number of sites were open from one to five on a Sunday for an initial period. Uh, we would encourage uh, um, certainly members and the public whenever this information um, is, is provided and we're, and we're good to open, to consider what time they, they visit at. Um, there are plenty of time during the day to come to the sites to incorporate it into other journeys so they're not making unnecessary travel outside the home, um, but certainly to look at the time so we avoid queuing uh, and we avoid any um, unnecessary uh, you know, backup of queues onto roads and so on. We have liaised with our statutory partners in terms of that. We have liaised across sections within councils in terms of health and safety, our events planning team, our media and comms team, to make sure we have everything in place for this to happen um, as soon as we're, we're, we receive notification um, in terms of, of the executive. Um, so that's the update on the reopening of recycling centres. Okay. Um, Connor, uh, and just to reiterate, Mayor and members, that um, as we sit today, um, the status quo remains, um, but we have made all of these preparations uh, in anticipation of um, some form of change to the restrictions. Um, if that were to happen, and it's clear, um, at whatever point that happens, we could then instigate these arrangements as quickly as possible afterwards. Uh, but for now, unless members are of a different view uh, and instruct us otherwise, this is currently the, the status quo. So moving to the next slide, please. In, uh, other aspects of one operational recovery, um, we're now looking at our civic buildings and our offices, Strand Road, Derry Road and Straban, um, the Guildhall and Harbour House. Um, the proposal would be during um, uh, what we call phase one is that these buildings would remain closed to the public. Um, and we're currently now working through the preparation of risk assessments and safe systems of work, um, social distancing guidance, how we would operate each and every office and each and every building uh, to facilitate a safe uh, phased return to work as and when that is appropriate. So there's quite a task of work in undertaking all of this, members, as you can appreciate, with each building and each office um, being unique. Um, some physical modifications may be required, perspex screens, things like that, um, where there are common areas. Um, and there will indeed um, be layouts um, that will have to be shifted around various offices. Um, during this phase one period, we'd look to undertake some statutory testing and inspections, um, but there will be absolutely a continued restriction on travel, uh, no attendance at physical meetings, uh, with the vast majority of staff still continuing to work from home. We're looking at site inspections for building control plan and environmental health functions. Um, whether these can be facilitated uh, during a phase one recovery period. Um, we're well through looking at risk assessments, operating procedures, looking at PPE requirements, assessing all of these issues at the moment, engaging with staff and engaging with unions on how they may be safely undertaken. Um, whatever we do with respect of this, um, each individual uh, site visit uh, will be assessed in relation to its own merits. Um, and there certainly will be a, a, a broad set of guiding principles, but each one um, will then be looked at specifically. Moving to the next slide, please, Paul. In terms of projects, a number of contractors members we can report have started to recommence work on site or plan to do so. Um, works have recommenced at Artie Garvin Pitch. Um, Chantalo Community Centre um, will reopen, the site will reopen on the 11th of May. Um, we've been advised by the contractor. Um, the contractor on top of the hill community centre advises that they are planning to reopen at the end of May and potentially the Straban Lifford Greenway contractor will restart within the next couple of weeks. Um, these are not uh, direct labour uh, contracts of council, they are external contractors uh, and we are working with the contractors to ensure that they demonstrate complete compliance with COVID-19 specific risk assessments and social distancing requirements. On. So members, as we go through from phase one into phase two, obviously um, we will only do that uh, uh, under uh, guidance and in strict compliance with any regulations as they, they change. 
and just reminding members of the core principles that we set out uh, to you a number of um, briefings ago, um, which guide all of our work uh, over the next number of weeks as we begin to slowly and assuredly recover, um, with Paramount uh, at the top of our minds being public health, the health and of our staff, um, the huge number of operational considerations, and always in full consultation and engagement with our staff and our unions. Um, but clearly, these situations must be dynamic, they must be responsive, we must be prepared to change, to speed up, to slow down, depending uh, on the nature of what we're doing. And throughout, indeed, um, throughout all of this emergency, we've tried to demonstrate absolute clarity and transparency in everything that we're doing uh, and moving forward. Moving on, members, to look a little bit today at uh, what we call strategic recovery. So beyond the normal operations of the council, looking to um, the wider council area and um, the strategic issues associated with it. The mayor has already mentioned the very welcome news today uh, of confirmation or earlier this week of the confirmation of the totality of match funding uh, for City Day and Future Fund and um, advances being made toward the long awaited medical school decision, um, which we hope will take place this month for a September 2021 student intake at McGee. That now enables us the first decision in respect of match funding now enables us to progress the strategic outline cases for the remaining projects along the riverfront and the key tourism projects. As uh, members are aware, a very significant amount of work had already been completed, drafting the strategic outline cases for those projects aligned to the funding that had been previously confirmed. So we can now complete that suite um, of strategic outline cases in the next number of weeks. Um, but there are Clearly, a uh, large number of issues still to be considered going forward. Um, we do hope to move swiftly now to um, uh, negative sign off and heads of terms. At this stage, we then move to the preparation of outline business cases. As we've said before, that's a process that is approximately a year to uh, up to 18 months. Um, moving then to uh, projects planning and development, and there will be a big discussion we uh, will require to have with government, with other government departments and, and with yourselves as elected members to understand the scale of resources and how we will put in place those resources um, to facilitate that very extensive um, next stage of work over the next 12 to 18 months, particularly given the financial constraints that we now facing. And uh, very, uh, significant key issue um, which um, was live before the beginning of the emergency and will hopefully become live again very shortly is the very important consultation on health sciences um, that Ulster University launched and the absolute need um, for allied health sciences now located at McGee uh, to complement um, the medical school uh, the innovation projects and all of the other key strategic projects within uh, both City Deal and Future Fund. Next slide, please, uh, Paul. Much broader, just initially touching members on other broader strategic recovery issues. Obviously, um, we will have to review the totality of our capital projects um, in terms of funding, in terms of time scales, which may have slipped. Uh, reviewing program and progress with all of those um, in due course, although we have been trying to do that uh, on a, on a real-time basis and, and bring you updates, as you know, over the last number of weeks. Um, a big piece of work in looking at festivals and events for the years ahead, for the year ahead in particular, um, with the initial key focus being on, on Halloween and proposals may be um, workable and doable and affordable. Um, city and town centres will be badly hit this crisis. Um, we are already working on some short-term proposals um, to avail of the infrastructure minister's um, uh, statement yesterday in relation to temporary closure of streets uh, and temporary pedestrianisation measures. Um, to 
quick regeneration of town and city centres. Um, so we're on that right now, but we're also looking at um, longer term uh, initiatives and incentives um, that may be required um, should the non-domestic rate space um, uh, take the um, have a detrimentally be detrimentally impacted, as per Alfie's presentation. Very clearly, members going forward, um, we do have to pay particular and extra focus to community resilience and support, um, a sector uh, and a section that has uh, seen us through this crisis and continues to do so. And also a big piece of work around economic development, tourism and business support. And I think we've, we've heard many times, um, and there are some opportunities in this, we have shifted over the last five, six weeks to a completely different way of working. Um, many of our staff, while very keen to get back into offices to work, um, have seen the benefit of um, flexibility in working practices. So we will move um, to address this in the medium to longer term to see where opportunities and further opportunities can be put in place through policies to enable people to work more flexibly, uh, to have a better work-life balance, to take more cars off the road, to reduce pressure in our car parks and our buildings, um, and to, to um, have that wider environmental, social, and economic benefit um, to our staff and to our communities as we go forward. And of course, all of this, members, as we know, is, um, will be informed, um, not driven, but certainly informed um, by uh, our financial issues that Alfie has mentioned. On the back of that, however, members, there are some um, short-term things to sell um, over the next uh, week or so. And so I'm now going to pass uh, to uh, Stephen and Aideen just to take us through some of the later moments um, that we look forward to over the next week or so. Thank you, and, and you'll see that uh, we've been working on some virtual events. So the first one there is just the, the virtual Mayor's Tea Dance, which was announced hopefully today, and it'll be on Tuesday, two to three, and uh, it's in conjunction with the Mark Patterson show, so we're looking forward to that, and, and uh, that should be a good event. And next slide, please, Paul. Um, with conjunction with our, tea, with our colleagues in leisure, we have a, a family fun run, which again is a, a challenge at home, but uh, again, they encourage that uh, health and well-being to get out into the garden, into the space that we have, and, and uh, so again, I encourage everybody to sign up for that. Next slide, please, Paul. Uh, this weekend as well, our museum team will be working hard on our collections, which uh, look at the, the VA Day and the Battle of the Atlantic and the the crucial role that this uh, region played. So um, that is all on our Tower Museum Learning uh, website. And uh, there's a lot of stuff there to look through. And finally, members, as we talked a number of meetings, the, the virtual jazz festival, which uh, starts tonight at half eight. Um, the uh, the program's very extensive. The, the team looked, worked very hard and there's been a lot of, of activity and traffic on the uh, social media. So we're looking forward to see how this, this works. The artists have put a lot of work into recording the, the sessions to get the sessions out. There's a wide variety of, of sessions there. And uh, Paul, if you just flip on to the next page, you'll see a, a selection of those and uh, some of the highlights that are jumping out. So I encourage everybody to go on and, and uh, look at it. Um, as per the previous meeting, we have a donate button which takes you straight through to the, the mayor's charity. So people who are watching can donate uh, online to those charities and hopefully that will uh, uh, generate much needed funds for those charities as well. So we're really looking forward to seeing how this works. Um, I'd say there's been significant activity and uh, interest in it. So uh, hopefully it'll be a, a success and uh, I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you. Um, that the officer briefing for today, Mayor and members, I uh, hope you found it useful and we're very happy as always to to take questions or clarify any anything members wish clarified. Okay, John, um, and I want to pay thanks to uh, all of the officers for their contribution this afternoon and preparation. 
of today's meeting and putting together each uh, presentation. Uh, thanks everybody who's continuing to work in the background and doing that. Uh, just I have a number of uh, members who have indicated to come in uh, to comment, John. Uh, so, but just before that, uh, in terms of just uh, obviously, John, the work that you've been doing along with Alfie in relation to ensuring that uh, we do have a bid in for uh, reduced income in terms of the losses that we are incurring during the pandemic. Um, obviously, I, I want to uh, support you in your endeavours in doing that. Um, it is a, a crucial time. It's very critical and it's key to everything that we want to do in taking forward all of the strategic projects uh, within Council uh, and year ahead. So it is an anxious time and we want to support you, John, and Alfie and others in, in ensuring that we do get um, uh, some of our reduced income um, uh, back in whatever ways or means we can do that. So, so I just want to pay tribute to the work that you are doing on that. Um, and also just to Paula, Paula, um, I know it's a difficult time for, for uh, employees uh, at this time within Council when we talk about furlough and staff. And um, I do know also it is an anxious time, um, like other members, I'm sure um, employees are starting to get a bit concerned when they hear uh, the word furlough. Um, so it is challenging. And, and, and again, uh, I'm sure I speak for all members. We want to ensure that um, every piece of work that you're doing, we want to um, make sure that you're, you're, you're supported and that the employees uh, also are supported at this time in terms of communication and getting that strategic information that employees need to know and have at this time. Um, obviously, John, you did mention that we have to wait until the British government also uh, decides on, on how many and who can furlough, um, and that can be anxious for our, our employees. So we need to make sure that they are getting the right communication and that they are there that's been communicated to them at this anxious time um just uh before i bring members and also i i just want to pay tribute um uh karen uh did also at the top of her presentation to the community and voluntary sector and all of the resilience teams that are doing fantastic work on the ground as we speak without this sector the work couldn't be undertaken um under these difficult circumstances, we have everybody. I've been out as mayor, um, doing my best to 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 try and um, engage with everybody in the community and voluntary sector, um, just to to pay my tribute on behalf of the city and district for the work that they're doing. And I've seen right across the city and the district uh, members uh, that the emerging of communities coming together um, from all sections of society working together ensuring that those who are most vulnerable at this time and those most in need are getting the support that they so rightly deserve. So I just want to commend everybody for doing that. And Karen, you also spoke about the crisis intervention. I also have been lobbied in relation to that. And I think um, uh, we need to do everything we can uh, to endeavour to, 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 and going forward, that, that, that the crisis intervention service is key and critical to everything that we're doing in terms of an exit strategy, not just here at local government, but for central government, we need to be mindful of people's mental health and well-being uh, when we are coming out of the, the pandemic. So, so the crisis intervention services will be critical to that work undertaken by everybody. So, if there's anything more more than above that uh, hasn't that we aren't doing already, then we'll all work together to ensure that. That those services are, are are met at this time, and obviously the the crucial funding needed for that service is there. Um, how we do that collectively, um, I, I'm happy to take up that conversation with others outside of this meeting, um, John. So thank you, everybody, and I've had a number of uh, members looking to come in. And for anyone who wants to come in, could they please indicate on the screen? I, I've have. Uh, Sandra Duffy, Alderman McClintic, Martin O'Reilly, and Sean Carr, and uh, Alderman Deveni also. So, Sandra Duffy, Councillor Duffy. Thank you, Mayor, for allowing me in. 
And I just want to say it, it's good to see you out and about through the communities. And I have seen that on your social media and it, it, it's good to see you out and about. And I'm sure communities really welcome you there as well. That you're showing them in terms of the work that they're doing, how appreciated they are. Um, John and um, the, all the council officers, thank you for the briefing again. It's always very comprehensive to get this update on where things are at. Um, I would also like to pay tribute to our frontline workers within the council. Um, they have been on the ground. They have been ensuring that council services continue over this period of time. Um, they have made sure that our bands have been emptied, um, our streets are clean, um, and all the rest of the, the things that they have been doing. So I want to just put on record our thanks to them. Um, I had took notes there throughout the presentation, John, so I, it's just a few comments on, on it. In terms of the AGM, I, th I think in terms of ourselves and, and the legislation going through um, around virtual meetings and where we're at with that, I think we're, we're happy enough to go ahead with the AGM as planned. I, I think it's good for the democratic processes to continue. I think we have been having these virtual meetings um, uh, over the past wee while in terms of the briefings and stuff, and they have been working well. Um, but if the, it comes to a stage where we can meet um, in person through social distancing, then that should be considered as well. So it would be good to get back to sort of the normal business of council in terms of having our committees up and running again. So that all has to be um, welcomed. Um, just then going on to the finances, as we discussed last week, we had an in-depth um, presentation last week on, on the finances. There's no doubt that there is significant pressures on council. Um, we're in a stark position financially across all the councils. Um, it's, it's a difficult time for us all. We have closed services that are bringing in um, money. We have outlaid money into the communities to ensure that services are delivered there. It was unavoidable. It was absolutely the right things that we did. It was the right decisions that we took in terms of protecting um, the most vulnerable and saving lives. And I think that that, that, has, uh, that has paid dividends. Unfortunately, we are in an in, in unfortunate financial position, but we guard it. Um, we have ourselves been having conversations within the party um, as group leaders throughout all the, council, the 11 councils, and we um, understand the financial position. We have ourselves been um, having conversations um, with the minister, the minister, as, as you say, she's aware of the financial pressures of council and she is very supportive of trying to address those issues. But as you stated, John, unfortunately, the amount of money um, far exceeds what her budget would be. Um, so these pressures have then gone to the finance minister, who is now in, in the process of lobbying um, Westminster in terms of the British Treasury. Um, we are in a, a, in a very poor position financially and going forward, we're going to see a lot of pressures on council. We're going to see a lot of pressures on a lot of services um, through, through the north that are going to need addressing um, as a result of what has gone on during this COVID period. Um, one of the things I suppose I would like to comment on is welcome the funding as well for the airport. Um, that does um, take a bit of the pressure off um, the council. We're, we're the only council that owns an airport. Um, so I do welcome that decision from the executive around the funding for the airport. Um, as discussed as well last week, we had a discussion around the furloughing of staff. So it's good to get a bit more clarity around that and the councils can have access to that scheme. And that may alleviate a wee bit in terms of the financial pressures that we're under. It's also good to see that we are planning to pay 100% of the wages of staff. So that means that none of them are going to be placed in financial hardship as a result of, of um, having to be furloughed. Um, in terms of the 20% uh, and the bid, we will take that back um, to the party and, and, and discuss that with, um, internally. Um, because we do know that the pressures that we're on um, as a council. Um, moving on then, the community response, as, as Kjarn has outlined, has been absolutely tremendous. Um, the volunteers working within our communities have gone above and beyond. They are out there every day delivering food, delivering medication, delivering isolation packs, and sometimes just being a friendly face or a friendly voice at the end of a phone. 
um, helping people to tackle the loneliness and isolation that people are feeling at this time, that they're separated from friends, from family, from other people that, you know, that is affecting their, their mental health. So I, I do think that, that people in the community who have been doing this really need to be commended. And that has been as greatly assisted by the Fountain that has come through DFC and the Fountain that has come through uh, the Council as well. So um, congratulations all around in terms of that. Um, Kieran mentioned the Community Crisis Intervention Service. I have to say I'm really disappointed um, hearing that news. It was something that we have been talking about before we went into lockdown, before um, we, we started having the virtual meetings. I think it was one of the last things that we discussed um, at, at a full council in the Guild Hall was around writing to the health minister around fully funding the service. We were asking for the health minister to come to meet with ourselves to discuss it. It's not a huge amount of money. It's a really vital service for the city and district. Um, it, it has saved lives and I think that we can't let this one go um, without um, a, a, a bigger fight. Um, and I would ask that possibly the mayor, you, you did discuss it there in your opening remarks. I do think it might warrant um, a urgent meeting um, with some of the key stakeholders, Mayor, um, around it, because I know that there will be a lot of people who are involved in the service that will be really disappointed today to hear this news. Um, I know that there's a lot of people who have um, depended on the service as well. And as you say, at this particular time, when people's mental health is suffering, um, as a result of isolation, as a result of anxiety around everything that's going on. I think that the amount of money that it, it that it costs to keep this service running is worth looking at and worth investing in. And I, I would ask Mayor if you could maybe look at some, doing something around that. Um, the cemeteries really do welcome the fact that they're open open again. Um, it was heart wrenching for people who um, had loved ones in the cemetery and couldn't act couldn't access it, couldn't get in um, to grieve. And uh, so it, it, it's great to see people being able to get back in there. Um, the waste um, services, all good. In terms of the recycling centres reopening, I don't think that we are um, in a place yet where we can look at reopening the recycling centres. The messaging is still there in terms of stay home. Um, and no non-essential journeys and other aspects. So it, it flies in the face of that a wee bit. But it is prudent of ourselves to be looking at how we do that eventually, putting in place um, our safety measures and planning ahead. So that, that that's all just very prudent on that. Um, around the, the city day, the future fund, the medical school and that whole growth, growth day, I think that's really welcome news this week. Um, last week, we were in a position where we were talking about the need for the totality of the match fund, but we're still a bit unsure of whether it was coming. So this week we're, we've moved on again. On Monday, we got the, the announcement around the totality of the match fund. So that's fantastic news for the city and district, but we do need the medical school now signed off. It is one of the key catalyst projects um, for the whole um, growth deal for the, for the city and district. Um, so today, again, we've seen that move on again with have been brought into the executive office. Um, we did see a bit of to and fro in where it was falling between stools in terms of departments. So this now should allow the medical school to progress, allow for the sign off before the end of this month, and then allow eventually for students to, to come on site. So it's all good news and it's all progressing in the right way for, for the whole city and district and the growth team. Um, just, um, I know we, we do need to continue to look to Dublin um, for um, their contribution to complete the overall package that we've talked about in terms of the, the overall inclusive growth deal for, for the Northwest City region. So um, I, I don't think we should take our eye off the ball with that either. And then um, Halloween, I suppose I look forward to seeing what we have planned there for the future in terms of coming out of um, this lockdown period, looking to something in the future that we can have as a celebration for the city and district. So I look forward to that. There's no doubt that we have challenging times ahead. And John, as you alluded to, nearly looking at what the new normal is going to be for ourselves. And, you know, there, are, there is different ways of working and we're seeing that in terms of virtual meetings. We don't have to be traveling. We don't have to be on the road to get business done. 
So, you know, there is new ways that we can be looking at and, and the new normal is the conversation that everybody is having, what is going to be the new normal. So it's good that we're having that conversation ourselves too within council. Um, so I suppose that's it. Um, I do look forward to the jazz festival this weekend. And I might even do the two kilometer family fun run. I might manage that one. So thank you. That's about a hike for me. Thank you, Councillor Duffy, for those uh, comments. Um, I also just want to put on record the Jazz Festival. I put a wee video up earlier and everybody tune in. It starts at quarter past eight this evening. So um, and just to remind everybody if they're tuned in and watching to uh, donate um, a small contribution to the mayor's charities also. OK, Alderman McClintic. Letting me in. Could I first of all say, um, just would like to be associated, our party to be associated with your comments, uh, our sympathies to all those who have been bereaved in these past days. I know I myself was uh, outside a house today where there was a funeral and have another one tomorrow. And it's certainly strange times for anybody going through a bereavement so just to be associated with those remarks. Uh, you also mentioned in your chairperson's remarks. Um, about the city deal. So just to mention that the city deal and the future fund now at this stage, it is absolutely great that after all the to and fro, we are actually beginning to see results and see, see this uh, funding being secured. And like Sandra before me, let's just hope that we get the medical school over the line as soon as possible. I think collective working between all the ministers and all the departments is essential just to get that last bit in place. It's absolutely essential for us. Um, in terms of uh, the report that came before us today, as far as the AGM uh, goes, absolutely happy to um, to agree that it would be preferable preferable to have it on the date suggested by John. I believe it was the 1st of June, but whatever date he suggested, that the date that we were to have it, I think we should proceed as much as possible as normal. Uh, moving on just to the finances and that's news, the £6.5 million loss. Um, and obviously we, uh, like everybody else, are trying to put our voice to those in Stormont to see what can be done to mitigate the losses. And uh, myself last night, I was on a um, 11 council uh, group meeting as well, and obviously everybody's experiencing the same financial problems as ourselves. So I can assure you that we are doing our bit as well to push and to, to push the, the need for help, uh, either from uh, Stormont or from uh, Treasury funds. Um, I think uh, on the recovery uh could just moving on into the recovery uh, session of it there. Um, I've already mentioned the city deal and the future fund. Um, it's good to see the events taken on in a new way, and it's good to be reminded about the jazz festival uh, starting tonight. And I hope to tune into that myself. And I think it would be remiss of me not to mention and to thank um, the FEE day. Obviously, is very important to very many people tomorrow. And of course, an anniversary can't be. Uh, can't be remembered in another time. Well, the next one will be the 76th anniversary and just doesn't have the same ring about it. So I think it's great that there are the, the Town Museum are putting on the virtual exhibition and the acts that are happening next week as part of a festival. And also Mayor Your Tea Dance, which is very, um, very much fits in with the theme of uh, going back to the old days or whatever. So thank you for that. And on that note as well, Mayor, I'd like just to say our thanks to you. You've been traveling around the different groups. And I think that's very much appreciated because it does let people know that not only their local community representatives, but council as a whole, a council corporate is behind and is noting the efforts that our communities are putting in at this time to help those within the community. So thank you for that. Um, and I think just hearing that John's remarks there about things will not go back to what they were before. And I think that's very good from a staff point of view as well to be able to build on the positives, the flexibility, and to see what will help to achieve a better work-life balance in the future. So there are positive things to be learned out of this. It's just um, a pity the news today there about the crisis intervention uh, service and like Sandra as well. I just wish that something could be done because it's something we're going to need more and more as we go through this recovery period. Um, and I think that I can leave it at that for now, Mayor. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you to all the officers and thanks to John for the leadership that he has going through all of this. And all the
so hard. Thanks. Thank you, Alderman McClintic, for those comments. Um, Councillor Sean Carr, Councillor Carr. Sorry, I beg your pardon, Councillor Martin O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, Mayor, uh, and thanks to John and all the other colleagues who presented this afternoon. Can I just start by agreeing with what you had indicated in your chair's business in terms of condolences to um, your uh, colleague in the mayor's office, Mal Duddy, on the loss of his uh, his mother and also obviously to former councillor Sharon Duddy as well. Uh, and also thank you for your comments about John. John was uh, a very well respected MLA across the political divide, a hard worker and very uh, tenacious on the Public Accounts Committee, among other roles uh, that he had, including serving as Deputy uh, Speaker of the Assembly. So uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, and obviously today is a sad day for the STLP, uh, as many of us would have wanted to be at the funeral and can't. Um, in relation to the presentation, uh, John, uh, thanks for that. And I suppose it throws up a couple of questions. First of all, in the order that they need to have been presented, uh, you talked about the AGM. I think we covered that already on the previous uh, session last week, but to agree formally with the other two previous speakers about keeping the AGM as close to the date as it is, uh, it would be the prefer the preferred option uh, for our party, you know, obviously given uh, that we can do it now with the regulations in place that we can do it online if needed. But obviously it would be best if we were able to hold it in, uh, in a sense, um, in the guild hall, uh, in limited space uh, scenarios if possible, uh, given that maybe just as other places have moved to having a, a dual hybrid function of some members in uh, in attendance in person and others online, uh, that there may be avenues there that, that, that we could explore. Uh, in relation to the committees, I, I, I mentioned previously that they need to get committees back in to operation again. And I'm just wondering uh, what the plan would be for the planning committee in that scenario, if, um, if John or any of the planning officers that might be on the call might want to outline for those on the planning committee what a return to committee business means for them. Uh, touching on the finances, uh, I, I know Alfie went into detail in relation to this both this week and previously about the efforts that have been made to central government for uh, for the, the assistance that councils will need. And obviously, people across in England uh, have seen the benefits of money has been given to local councils by the Westminster government. And naturally, people here will see, oh, the councils are getting assistance and some of that money is to come over uh, to Northern Ireland through the Barnet consequences. So we were told around 50 million was going to come to Northern Ireland. Uh, and I appreciate that Alfie and others are working hard to get as much of that into the the, the local rate period the local rate peers pockets as possible um, but any uh, any efforts that uh, that can be done to try and um, alleviate the impact of this on rate peers i think is going to be is going to be crucial so the furloughing of uh, of staff is so important in that regard uh, and i'm conscious that we did previously have uh, robust discussions about how we wanted to see uh, the staff protected. And I would uh, note that from your presentation, John, you're saying letters will be sent out, telephone calls will be made to uh, those staff that have been put on furloughed notice. Uh, I think it's important that we draw a clear distinction between people who are being furloughed and, uh, and people that have been made redundant. And, and it's clear that nobody's been made redundant in this scenario, that furloughing is simply a mechanism of protecting their job in the long run and uh, ensuring that the rate payer is protected as well. So that we, ha we have to be very clear uh, to our staff uh, that, that that somebody being selected for being furloughed is in no way an indication uh, of the fact that they have a limited value within our council. They, they are all still valued employees, but they may be just put on furloughed leave. And I think we have to get that message absolutely clear uh, that every single member staff is still valued, even if they're put onto furloughed leave. Um, that includes, I think, uh, people who work in the airport and uh, I would appreciate any clarification if uh, those that are working in the airport, albeit not directly council employees, but employees of the airport board, uh, whether they are being uh, uh, included in the furloughing scheme uh, would be beneficial. Um, in terms of the civic amenity sites uh, and the reopening, I appreciate Connor's uh, detailed response about how those should be reopened on a phase basis, uh, and we support the reopening on a, in a phase way. We also want to see 
clear evidence that staff will be safe in relation to that uh, piece of work because uh, the, the members of the public coming in large numbers is likely to arise on uh, the first day that they reopen. So the traffic management plan is so important, uh, but also I think that we need to make sure that we have adequate PPE for the staff that will be there dealing with the people when they come in. Uh, so again, any clarification from officers on the on the availability of PPE for staff who work in those uh, uh, civic community sites would be appreciated. Uh, on a related matter, it's been brought to my attention that obviously with more people not in their cars, not necessarily being able to go and exercise in the usual way that our greenways are becoming ever more popular. So I, there is seem to there does seem to be a need for additional bins along the greenways. A particular area that's been brought to my attention is down at Grantia under the where the, the existing greenway transfers into the council from the council owned land into the Western Trust land at Grantia, that there's limited amount of bins and Pacific specifically a limited amount of dog bins, uh, dog waste bins in that area. So if people could uh, could give some attention to those uh, parts of the of the city would be appreciated. Um, and then on the wider conversation that people have had about city deals and uh, the medical school, obviously we were very happy to see the city deal funding eventually get matched funded by, the, uh, by our assembly. Uh, it took some time for the assembly to be restored and when it did get restored, then it took some time for the Assembly to sign off the money that uh, that the British government had committed uh, in July of last year. So it's good to see that the money's there now. Uh, let's get on with spending it in the best way possible. And with that in mind, John, I'm conscious that there was to be uh, a meeting of the City Deal Working Group, which had to be uh, suspended given the, uh, the outbreak of COVID-19. So a date for that reconvened a city deal working group would be appreciated. Uh, obviously, the medical school is only a part of that work. Uh, and yes, today we've heard that the medical school has been moved from the Department of Health to the executive office as a project to be delivered upon. Uh, we, we, I think people in the city don't really care so much about whether it's the Department of Health or the executive office that, del that sign it off, as long as it gets signed off uh, in time this month for people to to be entered into the UCAS system for people to apply for the positions uh, in due course. So uh, the sooner that that happens, the better. Uh, and uh, as I said previously, that's only the first step on towards getting a, a larger number of university places for students in this city. Uh, finally, Mayor, in relation to the jazz festival and the other musical events uh, coming up, it, it, it is important that we have those um, positive events taking place in our city, uh, even if it's in a virtual way, because that's where um, things are going in terms of uh, events, festivals and so on are going to be streamed directly to people's homes, I think, in the future. And, and I'm glad to hear that uh, Stephen and, and Aideen ha, ha, in their presentation touched on how you'll be able to make a, a direct donation to your charities directly as opposed to having to go through third parties, uh, which I think is important as well. Uh, and I think that uh, the the need for the, the uh, Crisis Intervention Centre has been touched on by others and to fully agree wholeheartedly with, with the, the need for that funding, because we are going to unfortunately see uh, the ramifications of the, the this illness coming across into society in due course when we get back out of lockdown and the wider mental health impact of that uh, I think is, o is only now uh, becoming clear so we, we do need to make sure that we have uh, the right measures in place for the uh, crisis intervention service uh, in the city and beyond uh, and we were conscious that in our city it's uh, a service that we as a local council had to uh, help initiate and fund in other areas across Northern Ireland, uh, the funding for that happened uh, for, directly from central government. So uh, again, that's another example of our council having to do something that, that other council areas benefited from without the ratepayer having to fund. Uh, so I think that there is scope for asking central government to look again at, uh, at the, the funding decisions around that. Um, th that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councillor O'Reilly. Um, John, I'm not sure if maybe you wanted to um, comment just on the clarity around the furloughing of airport employees or PPE and staff in the recycling centres. Yes, Mayor, I'll, um, 
I comment on a few and maybe bring in one or two colleagues as well. Um, with regard and in, in order um, that uh, Councillor Riley raised the issues, uh, what would the planning committee look like? Um, uh, well, um, we now have the regulations in place to hold a virtual planning committee. It has been done with some degree of success in some councils in England. Um, we have looked at that. We will learn from that. Um, we we can't do it virtually or um, when we get to June, if the restrictions have been sufficiently relaxed, we may be able to look at a form of physical social distancing planning committee. Um, Philip or Karen, if you wish to add anything to that. John, just to add into that, that um, we have a meeting scheduled on Monday as an officer team to start work on drafting a protocol uh, for uh, virtual planning committee meetings, um, discussing the options that are available, looking at all three options, either a socially distanced meeting, a virtual meeting or a hybrid meeting. Um, and we'll uh, once we've got the outcome of those discussions, we'll be bringing that back to members, but there will be a, a planning committee in some format or other in, uh, in June, um, but we'll bring the, the details of the protocol back to members in advance of that meeting. Thank you. Um, in relation to furloughing, we have taken every effort this week in anticipation or in advance of this meeting members um to do what we can to personally contact as many staff as we can um uh, through telephone calls through webex meetings through line managers to uh explain what furloughing is all about and uh do what you've just suggested members um advise staff how valued they are how it makes absolutely no difference whatsoever uh to their pay or to their terms or conditions or to their employment status um, within Derry City and Strabane District Council, and also explaining to them why they have been selected as opposed to someone else. Um, so we really have tried to do that um, this week, um, and the letters will go out following um, this evening's meeting. There, there is bound to be someone out there who will still be concerned. Um, what I would ask members, if uh, you become aware of anybody who is, please direct them straight to us, and, and we will phone them immediately. Um, and talk to them uh, and try to assuage their fears or concerns. Um, at airport staff, um, the, 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 due to the funding that's been received by the airport, the airport remains operational and open. Um, there are a small number of, of casual staff uh, that the airport will now move to furlough. Um, but again, it will be along the same lines, even though the airport staff are not employees of council. Um, the uh, representatives of council on the board have reflected that council's view would be um, that furloughed staff are to be paid 100%. And the board of the airport have taken that into consideration and are proposing uh, to implement the scheme there in a similar manner. Uh, to council, in other words, treating the employees of the airport in a similar manner to um, direct employees of, of council. Um, I'll ask Connor to comment on HRCs, and I'm sure um, he's texting someone about bins um, uh, below the bridge at Grancha. But Connor, if you want to come in there, please. Right, so, um, Chair, um, I suppose I'll deal with the bins issue first. So we can just clarify and if someone can have a look at it on which side of that gate um, the, the issue is on. So obviously, uh, towards the bridge side, it's council managed. If it's through the gate and into trust lands, it will be uh, trust. But we can certainly speak to them and we'll address it with them. Um, obviously, if it's their lands, we need to discuss the location and, and all of those issues with them. In terms of the recycling centres and the uh, PPE, as I said, there are two elements to this uh, in terms of key uh, protections. One is staff, and the second is users of the facility. So the PPE requirements, these have all been reviewed again in, in consultation with uh, Council's Corporate Health and Safety Officer and taken on board national guidance as well. Um, and all of those uh, arrangements have put in place. And key to it is this, and it's good hand hygiene. So it's the wearing of gloves, regular washing, uh, disinfecting of uh, your hands and so on. Um, but as part of that, we will also, and we have also looked at our housekeeping arrangements. So, for example, um, 
we will be regularly disinfecting any of the communal areas that, that the public use on the site. So when they come into contact with handrails or equipment, we will be spraying that frequently um, uh, with disinfectant. So, so that will deal with, with an element of it. We will also uh, only be permitting one person to exit a vehicle at a time, for example. So again, that limits the context and limits the time that people will be on site. So I say that we have reviewed all of that. Um, we, we have um, updated the risk assessments to take account of updated guidance, guidance uh, WISH, which is a national organization that advises the waste uh, industry generally, um, has a series of publications. There's revision four um, of that uh, guidance. Uh, so it's been regularly, regularly reviewed since the onset of the pandemic. Um, and we, we um, abide fully with that and the guidance that you did not. So, so be assured that I say the protection of staff and the protection and safety of users is key to what we do in terms of PPE and say good housekeeping uh, activities within um, all of the recycling centres once they open. Thanks, Connor. And with regard to the last query, yes, indeed, we we um, we had a meeting with the City Deal Working Group set up just before the emergency uh, kicked in. We'll move to 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 get that rescheduled as soon as possible. And uh, also to provide a full update report into the uh, governance and strategic planning committee, um, which we're as of this evening, um, we're suggesting would meet on the second of June. Um, but we try to get um, a city working group meeting in um, if we can before that date as well. Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Mayor. Can I just ask a quick question back to Philip? In relation to the planning committees, uh, does the meeting have to be in the guild hall, or could we use another venue, like for example the foil arena, that would be large enough maybe to accommodate social distancing better than the guild hall chamber itself, uh, or does it have to be in the guild hall? Thanks, Mayor. And thanks to John and others for their. Martin, uh, I I think I need to go back and check this, but I think that there is this provision within standing orders, which states the venues where they have to take place. Virtual meetings can take place outside of those venues. Um, so we might require a little change to standing orders, but it's one of the options that we'll look at, Martin. Um, it certainly would be easier um, in some ways to do a, a socially distanced meeting than it would be for the planning committee than it would be to do a virtual online one, but we'll just have to Obviously, it'll depend as well where we are with lockdown as we progress through that. So I think what we'll probably do is we'll produce options and have a consultation with the, the members of the planning committee uh, as soon as we've got those options drafted up to see what members would prefer. And then we'll bring a, a, a paper to the uh, May Council meeting or to one of the members' briefings uh, to allow a decision to be made as to how they wish to proceed with the June planning committee meeting. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councillor Sean Carr. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, can I start off by thanking John and the officer team for their presentations today and also to be associated with condolences to the, the families that you mentioned in Chairman's business. I uh, send my condolences as well. I'll not be keeping you long. Just in regards to the cemeteries, John, um, our guidelines have to be on, burials have to take place by one o'clock. I've been contacted by a number of funeral directors who are having problems with that only on a Sunday because of church services and church practices that they're having bother getting there for one o'clock. Maybe if that there could be reviewed and maybe even speak to some of the funeral directors as well. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor uh, Mayor. I suppose what we've got in place is a set of uh, guidance. Um, where we experience, where someone is experiencing some difficulty with that, we're very happy to engage to see if we can come up with a solution. Um, so uh, I'm sure Connor would be content to do that. If you would um, advise us who in particular may have a difficulty there, Councillor Connor. Contact Connor, yeah. Thanks, Mr. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Carr. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Thank you, Mayor, for letting us in. And again, I offer my condolences as well that the, you mentioned previously. Um, the things I've mentioned, the city deal and the future fund, I am welcome the funding for it. I think that uh, I think that was a very powerful letter that we sent last week. They went up the road on a Thursday night and 
and on the Monday the decision was made. Uh, and in hindsight, I wish we'd sent that letter 50 years ago. What was what was disappointing was that uh, in the week this was announced, the university uh, dumped the key and resource. Uh, under the good news of this, uh, they seem to have just come out. And I think that this council needs to do something and, and it's power to ensure that the key and resource is restored. I think that when we look at the presentation and when Stephen was talking about there, uh, around some of the celebrations of VED, that, that I think that this resource getting dumped that's uh, in 75 years time, we'll be looking back and saying we did nothing to save this resource that, that puts dairy on the map internationally. So uh, very disappointed the, the university took that uh, road. And maybe in 75 years time, we might be talking about VI day, you know, with the information that's on there. Anyway, just on the presentation, I was just wondering around the recycling centres in the sense of some of the stuff is not allowed. And for example, like vans allowed in. Uh, and I was wondering, could there be any leeway given to people who are self-employed to with recycling centres as a, as, a, as a vital uh, resource for their revenue, for their employment? I, I, I'm aware of of a few people who are self-employed that use these centres can't get in because if it's a van uh, and they'd be self-employed for a number of reasons and some of them would be ex-prisoners uh, that, that uh, serve time long case and have buyers to employment and this is one way of being self-employed and not getting access to these is really uh, bringing hardship to them so i'm wondering could we could we look at that and we could have pacific People who are self-employed who need this resource could get in with hands. So I, I was wondering, could Connor uh, make some comment on that first? Thank you. Connor. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Obviously, Chair, as I said, we're, we're following uh, national guidance on this, but happy to consider and look at uh, how we facilitate um, others getting access. Um, simply, it's just about safety. I suppose control, and what I mean by control, it's not about, you know, it's about control the access and ensuring the safety of those who are using um, sites at this stage. Um, so look, it's something that we will look at over time. Um, these are initial restrictions um, to deal with the, you know, what we envisage to be a busy few days, but they will be under review. Um, once we feel that we can relax those restrictions, then we certainly move to that. But uh, it's something we consider and um, I can bring back to members. Uh, once we have uh, uh, further information and uh, looked at the alternatives. Sorry, Paul. Sorry, John. Just if, if I could say, see some of, the, some of these, this work that goes on with some of the self employed people, they actually relieve the pressure on councils and on councils' bulky lifts. So they, they, would, they would actually support the work this council is doing. So if there was some sort of engagement and, and uh, with these people, it would actually uh, go a long way to stop any, any illegal dumping and all the stuff that goes on, you know. I suppose just to add to you, um, the, the, the key principles that we've set out in terms of recovery are to be dynamic and responsive. And, and as Connor has said, um, uh, we hope that some of the limitations that for the reopening of the HRCs last only a number of days. It's simply an attempt to make sure that we don't have absolute pandemonium on the first couple of days that they're reopened. So we don't envisage that any initial restrictions would last any significant period of time. And we will be very dynamic and responsive and trying to open things up as quickly as we possibly can. So as Connor said, Councillor Gallagher would take that comment and log it. And, and see what we can do about it. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Geller. Um, Councillor Harkin, Sean Harkin. Thank you, Mayor, for letting me in. And uh, I would uh, like to thank the council officers uh, for the hard work that they've done in terms of uh, keeping things up and running and keeping us informed through this whole crisis. 
And obviously, uh, I would like to thank again the uh, Frontline Council staff that have stayed on the front line uh, when uh, many of us didn't have to do that. Um, I think everybody will join me as well in sending out our condolences to the, to the families of um, people who've uh, experienced loss in their care homes. Um, and I'm sure everybody has seen in the last week that uh, many frontline workers in those care homes uh, don't even receive basic uh, employer um, sick pay. They only get statutory sick pay. Uh, and, I, and I remind uh, the council that we have voted to call for the end of privatisation uh, of our care uh, homes and to return it to the NHS. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's good that there is a plan to restart committee meetings because we have a lot of work to do um, on that front. Um, I have a couple of uh, issues I would like clarification from councillor officers on, and then I've got a proposal. Um, so the first one is, um, well, uh, we, we have had a discussion about the, the, the floor falling out of council finances, and it's very worrying. And I, I, in, the, in the discussion last week, there was already talk about austerity and hard choices. And I think this council has heard over and over again that austerity is a political choice uh, and it's not inevitable. So, um, you know, I think we have to say as a council to both Stormont and Westminster that we need to see the magic money tree shook uh, so that ordinary people don't suffer. And I think something like a wealth tax so that uh, the incredible wealth that's in the hands of the few can actually be shared so we don't need to experience another decade of austerity. So it's not inevitable that um, uh, there needs to be impoverishment in this district uh, or that our council has to be forced into a crisis because of the, the COVID-19, because the wealth is there. So that's just a point in that. Then, then just some points for of clarification from the officers, if that's possible. Um, so last week, uh, we, we agreed as a council that we would write to the UK government and the Office of, Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister regarding remuneration for all frontline workers uh, uh, in all sectors, be that in pay or incentive pay or hazard pay or holidays, can, can we get an update on that? Um, the second one is uh, that we are obviously in a discussion now about ease and restrictions and exiting. And um, I've been contacted by a lot of workers um, in different places who are very, very worried about what going back to work will mean for them. Um, and in some ways, there people feel they will be forced back to work or forced on the airplanes uh, to fly to places like London. Uh, I'm just wondering in terms of, could we get clarification about the council's ability to conduct um, workplace inspections? Because this might be something that uh, we will need to do uh, to make sure that people in our district feel safe and that our council is playing a role in, in uh, making, uh, making sure that safety is fully um, implemented in, in workplaces. Um, and, and then uh, my, my, so that, that, if we could just get clarification on that and, and, and that other uh, issue as well. Um, and then Paul mentioned I, I, uh, the university, and I think it's again good that we're going to be having our committee meetings up because I'm glad we got the funding, but we also now have to make sure that Ulster University is held accountable. And there's the issue of the infrastructure um, and uh, and so on. So that that I think is, is going to be very important. Uh, my proposal is this. Um, I was actually quite surprised when I got the email from, I think it was Karen to say that the food parcel program has been capped um, and that uh, 400 people who are uh, who have been referred to that program are are now on a reserve list and have no guarantee that they're going to receive a food parcel. Um, and I think that that's straightforward discrimination because it basically means that if you found out about the food program first because you were connected to someone, uh, you get on the list, you get food parcels and now uh, you might not. So uh, it's been described as our district is over described that our district is oversubscribed. Uh, I don't think that's the right way to term it. Um, I'm actually very surprised that the department said that they thought that only 10,400 people would apply for this food uh, parcel because, I mean, we've talked 
over and over about the rising levels of deprivation in our district because of many factors, but including uh, Tory welfare reforms here. So it's no surprise to me that 18,000 people applied for it uh, across the north. And that, um, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, I've been telling people even this week that uh, that's the number to contact for the free food parcel. There's the text number. Um, so I'm a bit shocked that it's being shut down uh, already. So I think as a council, we should propose and agree that we ask the Department for Communities to reverse this decision to cap food parcels. Um, and, I, and I think that uh, we cannot justify 400 people in this district who've applied for it and been told they're not getting it. Uh, and people who have just got the number this week from representatives or from community groups that uh, it's closed and that you're not uh, you're not going to receive a parcel uh, until it's ended. So I want to propose that we that we uh, this, that we back that proposal as a council and put that forward. Thank you. Okay. Um, sorry, uh, John, if you'll allow me in there, just uh, uh, Councillor Harkin. I know just earlier on we did uh, put in proposals uh, at the top of the meeting around recognition of our or frontline workers or health workers and everyone involved in the front line. Um, and just on your comments there about the food parcels, I know this was raised with me myself. I did check this out. I think it's, it's more that supply um, has outstripped the demand um, uh, and there is that shortage. But I know in my own area, through the food bank, we are making up the, the gaps and, and, and no one is going without a food parcel. Um, I know there are or alternatives that people are trying desperately to ascertain in terms of making sure that the, the need is met um, in that regard. But I'm um, happy to hand over to the others for a comment there. Uh, John, if you want to make a comment. Or... Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Councillor Harkin, um, I'll just step through two of things. The letter um, that, that uh, flows from uh, last full council meeting. I'll ask Ellen or Philip to update on progress on that. <clears throat> and in respect of um, workplace inspections, um, we've, we've um, highlighted before the difference in responsibilities between the HSENI and councils with regard to premises inspections. Um, and of course, there will be, uh, there is the potential for additional inspections and enforcement um, uh, responsibilities on agencies now as a result of social distancing. That is a live conversation that's going on between the environmental health officers across the council and the department um, with respect to what they may, might look like, what type of guidance needs to be drawn up by the Department of Health and what role, if any, um, the councils have in that. Um, so rather than um, maybe go through the detail of that today, I'm going to ask uh, uh, my colleague Seamus uh, Donaghy um, to put to put together the up to date situation, and we will advise members uh, as early as possible next week through the briefing what the current up to date position and division of responsibility is, and the potential future direction of travel. Um, I think that's it in terms of officer clarifications. Philip or Ellen, do you want to come in? Um, as to you, Mayor, um, just to up update members that um, we, we have been progressing that doing the minutes of last week's meeting and have drafted those letters. So they're they're nearly ready to go, but they haven't been um, um, sent as, as yet. But uh, it, it certainly will be given urgency now. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, Councillor Gallagher, you wanted to second uh, Councillor Harkin's proposal on the uh, letter. Today. Yeah. 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 Um, members agreed. Um, Councillor Harkin, you just want to reiterate it was a letter to DFC around the capping of the uh, food parcels. Yeah. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Gallagher, um, and thank you, John and Ellen, for the for the updates. Yeah. So it's it's a straightforward proposal that uh, I mean I appreciate that there's other ways that people can access food, and there's food banks, and there's Lots of organisations who are working very, very hard um, to, 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 that are taking donations, but there's a difference here because this is the this is the government 
uh, it's their responsibility to make sure that people aren't in food poverty. And so the worry is that um, we've had the initial kind of COVID-19 crisis, but look, a lot of jobs aren't coming back. The number of people on universal credit has doubled in the north already, and, and that could rise even further. So I, I, I think what we're saying is to the department that, um, that this is an artificial cap and that they, that supply may have outstripped demand, but uh, I, I, that we actually need to have more supply. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a call on the department to reverse the decision to uh, cap the um, food parcel scheme at this moment, given that many more people have applied for it and should be receiving, and that there's potentially many more people in our communities that uh, would um, uh, access this if they, if they knew it existed. Okay, Mayor, could I? Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Duffy. Um, thank you for allowing me in, Mayor. Um, in terms of this proposal, I think that um, Councillor Harkin maybe isn't over all the details of it because, in terms of our conversations with the department, um, this is a supply issue rather than a resource issue. Um, the department is having difficulty getting all the stuff that they need to make up the food parcels that is where the difficulty is coming from initially the minister did state 10,000 food boxes that then went up to 18,000 food boxes they are now the department is now in the process of looking at where they're getting their supplies from for additional food boxes so it's not that there has been a cap put in this and and, and it, that is the end there are, the department is very clearly working on this issue to try and um, address it to ensure that anyone who requires a food parcel, anyone that requires any assistance can get it. And I can certainly say from a local level, in terms of the numbers of people that have been contacted in the Ballyarnet um, Resilience Team, what they have been doing is they have been topping up um, their own food bank um, from money that has come from council, um, from other donations and all the rest of it. So there is nobody that has been in contact with the Ballyarnet area of resilience team. I'm sure it's the same for all our areas across the city and district um, that is going without. Anyone that makes a call to the resilience team looking for assistance is getting that assistance. And the Department for Communities, the minister has done a tremendous job in getting um, food, getting resources, getting things on, on the ground for very vulnerable people. And I think she needs to be commended for that. And she is now in the process of looking at additional um, supply chains to address the current um, issue that has arisen in terms of uh, supply out, outstripping demand or the opposite. Okay. Uh, thank you, Councillor Duffy. Um, no comment. And I think uh, just by looking at the screen there, I think most people are in agreement um, to send the letter off. Um, there's no descending voices. If there is, just raise a hand. But I, I, I don't think there is. Everyone had the opportunity to comment. Okay, thank you, um, Councillor Harkin. Uh, moving on to Alderman uh, Devaney. Alderman Devaney, are you there? Yep, thank you, Mayor, for allowing me in. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to John and all the team, right down to the bin men for the great work. Um, mammoth task they've been carrying out over this last number of weeks. And I have to say there have been some good news as far as finance has been concerned over the last week. But th there is some, a dose of reality here when you look at the financial that we have lost um, 2.7 million in the first quarter uh, of the year. And I think that's a stream that's going to be carried on for quite a period of time. Um, you know, I just want to move on then um, down into Connor's department. Um, I do welcome the, the idea uh, uh, about the, the reopening of the recycling centres, um, you know, as soon as possible. And I do appreciate we have to get the regulations in place, which is very, very important, and the right PPE. The only thing, Madam Mayor, I have is, well, I welcome the, the, five, the five sites opening. When I look at the demographics of the five sites, there is only one. There is four opening down here in the Londonderry area. And there's only one in the Straban area, and that would be Strahan's Road. I did feel, and I had this conversation with Connor, that I felt maybe that the Donna Manor site even met the criteria because 
one way in and one way out. Um, you know, that would have taken in that whole Arctic Garvin area, Donamana, and even right out to that real, real rural hinterland of Plumbridge. Uh, I know I discussed the other ones, the ones in Newton Stewart uh, and the one in Kiln, but the, uh, I'm told by Connor there were difficulties with them, with the entrances going in and getting out. But I did think now that the Donamana one would have met the criteria. The the other issue that I wanted to pick up on, Madam Mayor, um, I know Councillor Gallagher mentioned it about vans and people self-employed. You know, really what we need to be very, very careful here that we're not getting bogged down into what we see as commercial, um, despite from, from being private household rubbish, because uh, the last thing we need, Madam Mayor, is someone ca calling at a house with a van, lifting a washing machine or a fridge uh, and charging uh, money for it. And then they take it to a recycling centre where it's disposed of free, um, you know, and that is a real cost to the ratepayer. Um, the other thing that I wanted to just mention as well, Madam Mayor, was as and when the recycling centres open, and we're all aware, and this has been raised, I was nearly going to say in the chamber before, but uh, about waste coming in from outside the jurisdiction. And I do believe, and I've spoke to Connor regarding this as well, I do believe we need to look at that quite seriously now, because when we, when we look at the, the losses that we're having, and the austerity that probably we're going to go into when this is all over. Um, the last thing we need to be doing is paying for waste to be disposed of from a different jurisdiction. And uh, I would like Connor to come back with a report um, at our next update or when he can regarding. I have a few ideas in mind in my head, Madam Mayor, that look, if somebody with um, a Donegal car or a car from the Republic comes to use the, 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 the centres, is that they even provide a license to say that they live in Northern Ireland. If they don't have that, at least they, if they could have, you know, a utility bill, a very much up to date utility bill, because, you know, when we, as I said earlier on, this is going to be down to a cost to the taxpayer or the ratepayer. But once again, I'm just re, and I have to say, Madam Mayor, I've got a few aggressive phone calls from residents in Donegal who have criticised us as a council for closing a recycling centres here very, very aggressive and they should be opened immediately. And I just want that recorded, Madam Mayor, that, you know, I did, uh, while many of the, the, the ones that did ring me, they withheld their numbers, but were very aggressive about our council closing the recycling centres. And I did go back to them and say, well, the problem being for yourselves is, you know, you are bringing it in free across the border. If you have to do get your bins emptied across the border, you have to spend 20 euros a week to get the bin. But I do believe, Madam Mayor, we should look at all that and the round and when we're moving on. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Alderman Devenny, um, for those comments. Um, I'm not sure, Connor, if you're still on the line, do you want to comment? Chair, uh, in terms of, of the reopening of centres and location, as I said, we, we um, have taken a risk based approach to reopening and it's on a phase basis, and our intention is to open as many centres as we can, as quickly as possible. But safety is a paramount issue, um, ensuring social distancing and things like that, and traffic out onto the road access points. We have considered all of that, uh, and that has led us to open the five largest centres first, and then we focus on how we get um, some of the smaller centres brought back into use again. Social distancing will be difficult uh, on some of them, it will be challenging, um, but as things settle down, uh, we can certainly review how, how we do that. Um, certainly, I can bring a report back into members um, on uh, use of, of uh, sites, uh, as uh, Alderman Devenny has requested. Thank, thank you, Connor. Um, moving on, uh, Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and um, thank you for that, man. Again, we'd like to share our condolences with the, the families who have recently had a bereavement and obviously um, the Jolly family and um, the Dalit family. Um, what I would like to say is also the same as yourself is commend the community and voluntary sector. Um, the the information that they've been, the, the packages that they've been, it's been immense. Um, and I know where Councillor Harkin's coming from in the sense of the, the boxes being kept 18,000 is disappointing. I was on a call with Nelga the other day where DFC had said it was a supply issue and that they were trying to revise 
family boxes rather than a, a household getting four individual boxes. Um, what I think might be helpful though is if um, we could get maybe um, the name of the lead partner within the communities to all councillors so that maybe any councillors that are feeling aren't there isn't enough support they can get in touch and find out because I know I've seen a lot of messages coming in there from other areas but our area nobody's going without there there's a lot of funding and in, um, in the rural areas which is going the other food parcels for people who are slipping through um, as far as the presentation goes, um, it's disappointing with the crisis of duration and please put my name forward for any kind of um, stuff we can do together cross party. Um, it, you know, it's a vital service for our area. Um, we lobbied our own uh, minister hoping they come down before the pandemic. So um, we would love to be a part of that. We're happy to go for the AGM on the 1st of June as well um, with the committees to get everything, the decision making back in place. Um, and again, thank you to John and the team for the constant uh, updates. You know, it's been great. Um, this is a very fluid situation where things are changing constantly. So um, that's been great. Furloughing staff, 100% um, wages is great again. Um, and then the, the phase one, two is very detailed. Um, we are happy for the, the things like the, the HRCs to remain closed until we have more um, instruction from the executive. Um, another, as I say, it's great to see our council leading the way in the sense of taking the positives of what we've done in the pandemic, you know, the the less traffic on the road and and looking at the, the flexible working and looking at the possible for working from home. So that, that is great. And I look very forward to the upcoming jazz festival. And I'm glad that obviously we're hoping to get some donations to your charities because at the moment with the domestic violence and the mental health, I think your charities are two big ones for helping those. So um, again, the city deal is great to have the match funding. Um, hopefully, as we've all said, we'll, we'll get that. Um, news is within the coming days that we'll be able to get McGee coming in for 2021. Um, and then the other thing is, about, I know we're anticipating the opening of the recycling centre soon, but um, if we could get all our councillors to just kind of push that bulky waste and that fantastic COVID-19 wasteland, we I think we're one of the only councils that have done that and it's a really fantastic, fantastic resource, so that could possibly take the pressures off too. But thank you and I'll leave it at that. Thank you, thank you Councillor Ferguson. And just to go back also, uh, you mentioned the crisis of prevention services. Uh, Councillor Duffy did uh, put a proposal to, to myself to meet with the stakeholders. Uh, I'll second that proposal and uh, I'm happy to um, get that meeting uh, as soon as possible. And I'll speak to, to Karen McFarland after this meeting and, and setting up that meeting. Uh, Councillor, sorry, Alderman Guy. Okay, thank you, Mayor, for letting me in. Um, uh, I'll start off by, by saying, um, I just said my condolences to Mal uh, on the passing of his mother and everyone else who has lost someone at this time. John Dallet as well, his family. Um, sincere condolences. Um, look, I'd just like to put, I'll not go over too many stuff because everything's sort of been covered there. Um, the Crisis Intervention Service. Constantly lobbying Robin about that. Um, I don't, in the grand scheme of things, it, it isn't a lot of money. Um, and I, to be honest, I, I don't see why they're holding back in money there and that there. Um, we heard there was 10 million put in for uh, mental health. Um, and, you know, I think it's a word, what, 229 for they run it for the year. We have a few extra helpers. I think you know that's a very worthwhile uh, service. Um, I would just I agree with what Sean Harkin says uh, over the DFC food boxes and so on. Look, I had I know that that the, all the neighbourhood partnerships and and whoever on all the community groups are doing their best to get them out the people that need these boxes but i referred 40 people just last week who had slipped through the net um now i have a few of them have got by now i have got them sorted through all our uh, uh food banks and stuff like that there but 
There is numbers that aren't are missing out on this, and there, I know that the, the community groups are trying their best to get it sorted, but I do think that it was just done, like it was announced on a Monday and put on the operation the following Monday. There was that short space of time, and it's it's been hard. Like there's a lot of people that live on their own that didn't know about this, and we're still trying to get them names through. Um, so I, I I would fully back the letter. Um, and maybe them food packs too. Go and do one or two people. Maybe look at the size of them. You know. Um, yes, it's great to hand them out and it's great to help people, but if people aren't going to use the stuff. Maybe a smaller parcel, go a wee bit further. You know. Um, that's about it for now. Oh yes, just one other thing. Um, in regards to the rate relief for businesses, or the, sorry, the, the rate scheme for businesses, do we know in the council area how many eligible businesses they were uh, in regards to 10,000 and 25,000? Um, and how many businesses have been paid out and how many missed out? Uh, I know they, they've announced a new scheme, which we're hoping that there will be more information put out over the weekend. But there is a lot of businesses uh, who are missing out on this by just maybe a couple of hundred pounds. Um, and they're struggling because of it. So we just maybe check that up for the next time and see what sort of numbers we're talking here in the, the, the council area. Okay, thanks, Mayor. That's all right. Hey, Alderman Guy, um, just on that, I don't know, maybe if Alfie's still on the line, John. Um, maybe yourself or Alfie want to, to comment on Alderman the Venice? Um Stephen may um, be able to comment on that as well. Obviously, we've been in touch with hundreds and hundreds of businesses over the last number of weeks, uh, both informing them of the various schemes that were there to support them, but also getting feedback and actually trying to influence some of the new schemes that were coming forward. I don't know if you've got figures like that at your fingertips, Stephen, but maybe you just want to add some. I don't have the figures at my fingertips, John. I mean, obviously, we work with a lot of the, the businesses. Uh, most recently on the uh, the bigger grant where we've been doing a lot of the verification work and contacting the business directly, um, where uh, LPS has been struggling to get a contact. So what I can do is gather up all of that data as, as to what we know of the business who have received it. But also the businesses who haven't, and uh, bring that back to the next briefing. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Alderman McCain. Alderman McCain. Yeah, yeah. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Mayor, for letting me in, and um, uh, a praise to John and all the officers of the of the team for the good work and the up to date, and obviously condolences to everyone who's lost. But um, I suppose uh, uh, Alderman Devaney's concerns was similar to mine uh, on the, the opening of the recycling centres, and uh, <clears throat> he's more or less asked my questions that you know that, that there would seem to be the majority of them would seem to be around the city area. And uh, us up here in the west, and myself, and I'm sure the other local councillors in the Derg area and Straban area are getting a lot of phone calls and inquiries about when are the domes opening, uh, are the recycling centres, and I suppose just to Connor if he's there, I'm I'm assuming that the details of what uh, areas is opening will be put up on the on the on the website, the council's website, and the plans for to maybe reopen the other recycling centres because um, I know once they start to open rear down around the city that we're we're going to be getting a lot of uh, inquiries up around here. How come they're opening there and they're not opening there? And and Connor has already explained why. But I think if uh, you know if the dates was put up on the on the on the website, it would uh, you know we can refer people to the website and and and, and it's easier that way. I suppose just on the crisis intervention service, yes, obviously we would be lobbying for for the money for it and. Uh, Mental health and addiction is something here that we need to be starting to maybe turn our attention to uh, as hopefully 
we will be coming out of this COVID uh, crisis at some stage because I think the, the mental health and addiction, the underlying uh, conditions here are going to be serious. And I know the Trust has a psychological help laid out for staff. And uh, I'm sure the council probably has one as well. Uh, and I, as I say, I would just encourage uh, you know, council and that mental health and, and addiction as the underlying there's going to be an underlying issues coming out of all this. Um, and that's basically it. It's, it's just, uh, I suppose, we in take the centres open as soon as possible as well. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alderman McCain. Thank you. Um, Councillor Donnelly. Right, uh, thank you, Mayor, for, uh, for letting me in there. First of all, I'd like to start by offering uh, my condolences to Mal Duddy on, on the death of his mother, uh, Philomena, and to the family of uh, John Dallet. Regarding the, the, the food ba uh, boxes, uh, Mayor, there, and, and there is a problem with the delivery, I've pointed that out, uh, the, the mechanisms. Uh, I did say that, that it would exclude some people within the community and I have no doubt, I know that it has. Uh, it, it, there's individuals and there's uh, community groups who, who have a problem with that uh, delivery. And, you know, there is people, there is no doubt here, there is people slipping through the net. And there is charities and, and community groups out there who are at the coalface and they're attempting to, to rectify that. You know, there's two or three uh, organisations in this city who are delivering between them hundreds upon hundreds of meals per day to uh, vulnerable people. And I, I don't use the, 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 the boxes system myself, but I have signposted people who, uh, people who do use it. And I can tell you here now that some of these people haven't got the boxes. I know there's community groups who have spoke to to uh, the council regarding they had a problem with the delivery service and it was attempted to be resolved. They eventually gave up, you know. So for people to come on here and say that there's nobody in a certain area uh, not getting the boxes is unbelievable because believe me, it is happening. And I know, I know some people who've been approached to are getting the boxes and they've been asked, would you take one every two weeks? Now that is putting people under pressure to agree to that. And that, in my view, shouldn't be happening. That needs to come from the people who are who, who are receiving the boxes. Regarding the Crisis Intervention Centre, everything that's, that uh, needs to be said has been said. This, uh, you know, by, by dealing with people in the Middle East, you can see a deterioration on people's mental health. You can actually see it. You can see it in the circumstances that they're living in. You can see it in their behaviour. So I think it's imperative upon us all that we need to do everything in our power to uh, rectify the situation. Thank you, Mert. Thank you, uh, Councillor Donnelly. Uh, Councillor Logue. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to touch on some of the comments that Councillor Donnelly has made. I have witnessed uh, from my own house, you know, the hard work that has gone on in the area by all the community groups. Now, I do understand that there may be slippages, but if I was in that position that I knew of people who slipped through the net, then I certainly would be making that representation myself to the, the group uh, who organised the, the delivery of the food campers uh, so that those people are not falling through the net. It's not good enough that the people come on here and say that they're falling through the net. They must follow it up with actions of their own. And, and that certainly would be concerning. I certainly will, for my part, I will be um, contacting uh, the delivery service uh, as of today to see just what um, what uh, the situation is. I do know that I did refer a few people and give my own phone number and just less than, well, maybe a week, two weeks ago, I received a couple of calls from the delivery service, not knowing it was me, just to make sure I had um, received my parcel. So I do know 
that calls were being made to the actual people who were referred, but certainly it is a concern that if people are out there who need any kind of assistance, then councillors must be doing all that they can to ensure that that assistance goes to them from the relative of relative people. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Duffy. Uh, Councillor Burke. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, well, Councillor Logue there kind of covered a couple of things I was going to say. It's just in relation to the comment around the phone calls that were made about changing the the timing of the half Thursday weekly to fortnightly. It's just to give clarity in terms of the mirror. That was based on feedback that was given from people who received the hampers who were basically ringing the helpline up to explain that it was too much and they weren't using it all and could they be moved to fortnightly. It wasn't done to put any pressure or put anybody in a position. Um, and I just think that as to reiterate what Councillor Logan said, if people are aware of anyone that is falling through the net, there is mechanisms there, particularly within the mirror area. They contact the mirror uh, crisis helpline. There has been nobody to date that I'm aware of, and I would be heavily involved in it, that has came through the resilience team that has been left with no, not getting nothing or have been missed, as I said. But there is mechanisms there in place, but most of the other things Council Lowe kind of touched on them anyway. So thanks. Uh, no bother. Thank you, uh, Councillor Burke. Um, members, I've had no other member looking to come in, and uh, no one else has indicated. Uh, so um, I'll move on um, to the next uh, item of business this afternoon, um, which is the uh, update on the wavering of the burial fees. Um, and there's a paper there, pages one to two, uh, for everyone. Um, so, John, is it yourself that's taken this? Um, Karen, she's on the line. Um, Mayor. Yeah, thank you, uh, John, um, and through you, Chair. Uh, members, uh, you have the report in front of you, and members, it's to advise you in regard to the implications associated with the waiving of burial charges for those suffering bereavement during the, the current pandemic. Um, and members, at your meeting on the 30th of April, you asked that burial charges for those who have passed away during the current pandemic be waived. Um, and officers agreed to bring forward a paper outlining um, the implications in relation to that. So, members, uh, in terms of the key issues, approximately 70 burials take place within uh, council cemeteries on a monthly basis. Um, and the fees associated with that are approximately £13,000. Um, members, the regulations came into effect on the 28th of March for a period of six months. And members may want to con consider commencing the scheme from this state to include all burials. But members, there were a small number of COVID related burials that occurred in our council operated cemeteries before this date. And members, you may wish to extend the scheme to include those those burials as well. Um, members, it, it should be noted that bereaved families in receipt of particular benefits can uh, receive financial support for funeral expenses and this specifically um, includes um, burial charges um, and members we've sent you a copy of uh, the support um, with your paper today members again burial fees are generally paid by the funeral directors and therefore their cooperation in this process would be essential so in terms of the financial and other implications, members applying the waiver for the initial six month period would result in a loss of income to council of approximately £78,000. Um, and again, members, uh, as uh, we outlined and, and you spoke about last week, the measure would only apply to council burials um, and therefore the scheme wouldn't extend to church graveyards that uh, are in operation the district. Uh, members, you will be aware from the financial briefing that we had um, today that Council is, is currently in 
incurring losses of approximately £700,000 per month as a result of the closure of our facilities and services, additional waste management costs and exceptional emergency expenditure during the pandemic. And whilst a regional bid is currently being considered by central government, this has not yet been confirmed and may only part fund some of the financial loss that's been incurred. And members, uh, the waiver of burial fees would worsen this position. So, members, we would invite your comments and recommendations today in relation to the report, and in particular, uh, the period of the potential waiver. Um, we would like clarification, if possible, on that. Thank you very much, members. Okay. Thank, thank you, uh, Karen, for that uh, report and the paper that um, was put to us in terms of the recommendations. Um, just a few comments I want to make. Um, it was a, a proposal that I had put forward to council, and um, you know, and I hope today people will still continue to support that. I, whilst I do appreciate the burden on council uh, in terms of the cost of this. Um, since this uh, went live, I've had uh, um, quite a number of people contact me, um, particularly people who had family members bereaved recently, um, to say that this is a very humanitarian thing to do, and they supported it very, very largely. Um, I just want to make a comment on 3.6 um, about bereaved families and receipt of particular benefits that receive financial support for funeral expenses. Can I just say that as a very nominal fee, and it certainly doesn't go in any way to cover the cost of a funeral. Um, I, I mean, I know from my own experience, family experience, there is there is that support there for people on benefits, but it's very, very little. They get very, very little. I do appreciate um, my own minister bringing forward um, uh, proposals also in regards to to people on benefits and, and, and that within during the COVID-19 pandemic, and I want to acknowledge that also. Um, uh, the, taking on board the cost of the opening of the graves and everything else uh, on that said, um, I, would, I would like to see this scheme commenced as soon as possible with, with the um, others that, that, that are sitting outside of, of the timeline who did die of COVID-19 to be included in that. Um, and you're absolutely right. It's not, it doesn't extend to churches or graveyards, but it would be uh, uh, churches that own graveyards. It would be my intention though, to write out to those churches to um, ask them to do the same if that was something that they so wished to do. And it would remind members also maybe to consider doing that also to, to their own churches. Um, as I say, I, I brought this proposal forward, um, and I do believe it is the right thing to do at this current moment in time where people are facing a financial crisis of their own because of work-related issues and people who, who cannot afford um, you know, the income, the result in the loss of their own income, who will be finding it very extremely difficult at this time to um, deal with the, the way now that we have to um, bury our loved ones with no wakes and, 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 and no funerals. So that in itself is a, a suffering that has brought on people who have now been bereaved. Um, so I, I would want to move um, on this proposal this afternoon and hopefully get um, full support of council members for doing that. Uh, and whilst doing that, acknowledging, yes, that there will be a hardship in terms of the cost to, to council in this, but I am aware um, that we have, um, you know, in terms of uh, in the past, that this council has provided um, funding um, for for festivals, events, up to to the tune of this amount also. Um, and I think, as as people have said to me, this is a very humanitarian thing to do uh, in light of the circumstances that we are facing. It is unprecedented time, so I do believe, in terms of uh, the cost, um, we we should have regard for those who are bereaved within our city and district. Um, at this time, and the waiving of burial charges for those who are suffering um, is the right thing to do, in my opinion, and I would like to get full support for doing that this afternoon. Um, I have a number of speakers looking to come in, uh, Councillor Sean Carr, then Councillor Paul Gallagher, Councillor Martin O'Reilly, and then Councillor Duffy, um, and Hillary, sorry, Alderman McClintic. Uh, Councillor Sean Carr. 
Thanks. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for bringing me in. Um, when you suggested this last week, I supported you helping brief families. Um, but I, I did mention about private burial grounds, church grounds. So people from Comor, the castle there, are all rit pairs. And more than 50% of them would be going to church graveyards or uh, mostly church graveyards. Uh, Waterside, mostly go to Ardmore. As uh, half of their band goes to Melmount. So we would be discriminating against 50% of our population. And I think maybe there's something else that can be looked at to help three families. Because their loss going to a pray, uh, church graveyard is as big as somebody going to the city <coughs> to the city cemetery. So maybe it's something else we need to look at. Because uh, they're as I say they're all red pairs and we can't discriminate against them. I uh, say they're grief. Now I do welcome the the minister bringing the funeral uh, grant up to a thousand pound, bringing us into line with England, Scotland, and Wales from seven hundred. We've been on seven hundred, <coughs> seven hundred pound, bringing it up to a thousand pound plus the price of the grave. So yeah, I would uh, ask, so seek some sort of clarification. If we don't charge for that grave, will the Department of Communities withdraw that fee, that part of that fee, on an application for a funeral grant? Given that 70 80% of our people are putting on for funeral grants. So I would just say clarification with that money, with that grant, will it stay in or will the, the Department take it out and just give you the thousand pounds, where it's a thousand pounds plus the price of grave? Um, if somebody could answer that for me, I would much appreciate it. But honestly, to discriminate against 50% of our constituents, I would find it very hard, Madam Mayor, at this point to support that. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Councillor Kerr. Uh, this proposal isn't to discriminate against anybody. As I said, I, it's my intention to write to all the churches. And I would be of a mind uh, of all members also to write to their churches uh, to um, implement the uh, proposal that I'm implementing here today uh, in terms of, of the cost and, and, and waiving burial fees. Um, I'm not sure, I can't answer the, the second question in relation to the funeral grant. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if, if, if within that it is stipulated that it is for a burial fee. I, I, as far as I'm aware, it's the, the uptake has been up to a thousand pound. I don't think it clarifies whether it, what it cost. I think that the the uh, grant has just been enhanced, and there's no stipulation on what it should be used for, uh, other than uh, you know supporting a family to bury their loved one. Sorry, mate. Can I clarify that for you, Madam Mayor. The yeah. Grant is a thousand pound plus the price of the grave. If your grave is only a reopening, you would get eleven hundred and fifty-eight pound. But if you're buying a purchase of the grave for the burial, you will get thirteen hundred and fifty-eight pound. And it does stipulate for burial or cremation. Standard thousand pound, but then how you know, cremation or burial is separate. So that money is stipulated for the burial, and it's on the it's on the form. When you get it back thanks okay thank you uh councillor Carr, for that clarity thank you uh councillor paul gallagher thank you mayor and like a previous speaker this was brought up last week i i wasn't sure that this had been thought through fully and sean Carr just highlighted there that we're not sure what we're doing here and when the cost we could be wavering the cost and all that money get taken back by government so we would actually be wasting our time if, if as sean says is correct but mayor when we go and a number of the earlier briefings that we got in march uh and, and thankfully they didn't come to uh fruition in the sense of the expectations and the expectations were Within the district, there would be up to 800 deaths within the district. And that, and that was in, in the first run of this virus. First run. There's no, there's no uh, 
There's no guarantee that that first run is over or how long it's going to run. And there's no guarantee around a second wave. But there's growing concerns around a second wave. They're going to come. So this proposal, and it's based on the usual 70, it's coming to a cost of 78,000. But if there was any input and a rise on that 800, then that's going to affect, affect that 78,000. And I believe that the real cost will far exceed that 78,000 pound. We're having a discussion in, in this council meeting around facing losses to this council of six and a half million pounds. Where what the implications that's going on? The real implications that are going to be redundancies. It's if if we get to the end of this road in September, we're talking about being insolvent. Insolvent. So that's us having no cash. No flow. The, just the natural uh, result of that is going to be redundancies. And I said it last week that I believed that if this proposal goes through, the council will be accused of being reckless in the face of having the knowledge of what's running uh, at a major, major loss, millions of pounds, and agreeing something that's open ended, that we have no control over. We're not sure when it's going to end or how much it's going to be, but I believe it could run on the, the hundreds of thousands. Because if we were talking 800 and, and you multiply the cost, you'd be up on a quarter of a million pound. And if you if you think how many people we can employ to that, and then, and, and I think what, what Sean Carr said there very much, we're making a, a decision that's got inequalities in it. Uh, and Believe me, I don't want to add to anybody's pain who's had a recent bereavement and putting those people on the front line with now an expectation coming through your council that this is going to happen. I don't think uh, that that's put us in a good place with people who are bereaved. But the fact is, Sean says, and he's got experience of it, 50% uh, are, are going into church graveyards. So if, if this was to become across the board, then council would have to uh, subsidise that cost to the church because I don't see any churches waiving uh, costs. Churches, are, are, and we've heard them, they want to open because they haven't been passing around their, their collection trades, so they're losing a lot of money they, that they would normally have. So they're not going to be waiving any cost anytime soon around real costs that they're going to have. So I don't think writing a letter to the churches We'll have, we'll have any iota of a difference. So I'm going to finish by saying I can't support this motion, and I think we do we do see ourselves standing. I've, I've been accused of making a reckless decision if this is supported. Okay, thank you, Councillor Geller, for your comments. Uh, Councillor O'Reilly. Yeah, thanks, Mayor, for letting me in and. I take on board the, the previous speakers and their contributions to, to this debate. Um, I know that the that obviously this issue affects a number of councils uh, and that in other council areas, uh, correspondence has already been sent to the relevant minister to see if they can incorporate the, these costs into the Department of Communities budget uh, as a means of helping the, the, the alleviation of, of the difficulties that councils are having. I'm wondering whether if we were to waive our fees, that in turn might be used by central government against us in a future debate to say, well, you uh, you were happy enough, to, uh, you know, to, to write off that uh, th 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 that fees themselves. So, has there been any, uh, you know, a question for officers through you, Mayor? You know, has there been any contact from uh, the Department of Communities on whether they would cover the cost of this, uh, or indeed have other councils? Made representations uh, that our officers are aware of uh, in, in in a similar vein as what we're thinking about here this afternoon. Um, in terms of the report that officers have put together for this for today, I'm also raising a query in relation to what fees we are waiving. Is it the fee just for the opening of the grave, or is it the fee for the purchase of the plot? 
because if we are doing both, then they're without any adequate measures in place, we could be leaving ourselves open to a situation where people bulk buy graves and effectively uh, land bank them uh, in a way that exposes the council to, to a loss that a grave has then not been used uh, for these uh, unusual and strange times. So we have to be careful to make sure that we're not leaving ourselves open to abuse uh, by people who, who may feel that now is the right time to go and purchase a plot because the council is waiving the fee for that. So clarity from officers on that point would be useful. And I suppose that leads me to the final part of the questions that I have in relation to this in terms of the time frame. When this came up last week, I touched on the fact that, uh, as you yourself, Mayor, uh, as referenced, this is been seen as um, a, a very clearly a humanitarian response by our council to the to the the needs of grieving families, uh, and as part of that, um, I had referenced the fact that people aren't able to grieve in the normal way by going to a grave site to have the large family uh, gathering at the grave site to have a wake uh, to allow people to visit. Uh, the family and, and, and pass condolences uh, in person. So it was in those con in that context that we were talking about waiving these fees. So if those parameters are then removed by a removal of the lockdown, that people can begin to grieve again in the normal way and have people attending in the graveyard uh, at increased numbers than what is currently the case, then I think that this proposal then uh, the grounds for which it was introduced uh, will will wash away. Uh, so I'm not sure whether we need to have uh, it open for the six month period that uh, this report touches on. Uh, that if the if the lockdown measures that are in place currently are starting to be relaxed, although they're not being relaxed today, but they seem to be relaxing uh, in in days and weeks ahead. Then I don't see this proposal needing to be continue to be in place uh, for what remains to be the, pretty much the the, the the rest of this year. Uh, so I think that, that we, we need to get more clarity on the time frame uh, and the reasoning behind uh, keeping it open for six months. Uh, so there's a couple of questions there, Mayor, which I'll, I'll take. I'll get answers, I'm sure, in due course. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Sorry, thank you, Councillor. Yeah, go ahead, John. Sorry. Some of the questions there, and then maybe Karen Phillips could also um, assist with some of them. Um, the time frame, um, obviously, members were, will be guided by yourselves in the time frame. Um, I know at the last meeting there were a number of options considered. Um, we've just simply suggested that that might be one you would consider, but obviously, there are other mechanisms for measuring the time frame. With regard to the fees that are included, my understanding is that it's the fees for either a first purchase and opening or for a reopening, depending on the personal circumstances. Um, there is no ability to land bank, um, if that's the correct word. I'm not sure that it is. But um, in, in any of our cemeteries at the moment, there's no forward purchasing is allowed. Um, and I'm not aware of contact with DFC in this one, but maybe Karen can just clarify that for us. Yeah, sorry, John. Thank you. Through you, Chair, uh, members, uh, we have not made contact with the department in relation to this, um, but I am aware that uh, one uh, or more of, of the other councils have done so. Um, so, Mayor, certainly that's something that we can do should members want us to do so. Thank you, uh, Karen, for that, and John. Um, Councillor Duffy? Councillor Duffy, you, Mayor. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, yeah. I have an internet problem here, um, but no, I, um, I think some of the language that was used there was a bit alarmist, to be honest. I mean, it, um, bankrupt in council, discriminated against 50% of the repairs of council. Um, I don't get it. Um, I think what your proposal, Mayor, is doing is a very humanitarian motion in terms of addressing some of the issues that grieving families have been experiencing over this COVID period. 
Um, we have had families who have been bereaved by both COVID and other tragedies or other uh, sad circumstances that haven't been able to grieve um, the way they normally would. They haven't been able to plan a funeral the way they normally would. They haven't been able to have the funeral that maybe a loved one had talked about for a very long time. I, I know personal family members that talk about their funeral for years. So, you know, there's all these things that need to be taken into consideration. Your proposal in terms of this was a very genuine one. It came from a very good place in terms of addressing some of these issues as a gesture to these families. Um, I think that in terms of the, the time frame, I think what we talked about was having the time frame around um, the restrictions being in place around funerals. I think that that is um, a, a time frame that we can all work with because we know that those funerals aren't taking place in the way the families would like them to take place. I think we should include um, the COVID burials that have, uh, have taken place outside that period as well that have already uh, occurred because that would be um, a, a nice gesture for us to do. It won't bankrupt council. Yes, council are in um, financial difficulties as are all councils at this time. But you made a very good point, Mayor, in terms of the money that we spend on festivals and events um, can at times far exceed this amount of money. Um, as a party, we will certainly be supporting um, this initiative. We think that it's a good initiative and it's one that was very welcomed by the people of the city and district um, in the press um, last week. So I, I have seen that and I've seen it in social media and we for one will be supporting it and think that it is a good initiative and would appeal to other people to um, think about it um, carefully. I mean, if it's not going to bankrupt council, um, we are also going to write to um, churches. We can't control what they do, but um, yes, um, a lot of our citizens are buried in church grave graveyards and we should be writing to them and ask them to, to do a similar measure. I think that that would be a nice gesture for them. As Paul says, they probably won't. Um, but I think that it's something that we should certainly ask them for. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duffy, for your comments. Alderman McClintock. Thank you, Mayor. And I suppose that when this came forward, we could see it really was a really humanitarian gesture coming from yourself and one that we really have every sympathy with. But we, and we know it's under consideration in a number of councils throughout Northern Ireland at the present time. But I suppose the first thing that I wanted to raise was the one that Sean Carr has already raised, and obviously he's much more of an expert on this field or in this field than the rest of us. But he did mention that 70 to 80 percent of people do get grants. And I'm very concerned that if we waive the charges, that those grants will be reduced. Therefore, we are doing ourselves no favour. In that case, all we're doing is pushing the burden from uh, the grant from the central government onto ourselves and council. And I suppose one of the things where I'm slightly confused is our reasoning for doing this, because I'm hearing a lot of comments today that the reason we're doing this is because uh, people don't have time to grieve. But I would have thought the real reason to do this was because people don't have the income if they have reduced income at this time. It's fine for those of us who have no difference and have a fixed income that hasn't been altered. But I would have thought the real reason for doing this was when somebody's income is reduced so therefore in a sense i wonder at the the rationale behind saying that we do this until people can enter the graveyards again in the way that they did before um if we go forward with this and i think it's no easy decision because we are all concerned about showing a humanitarian um uh, side to ourselves and the council here uh, i think that if we do go forward we have to be very very clear and very tight on the time frame i, I do wonder about the figures that have been mentioned that 50 percent of burials in the waterside go to Ardenmore. I mean, we have Ballyon Cemetery, we have Altney Garden Cemetery, we have Glendermott Church Cemetery, we have many others. So I don't think that, I mean, I, I find it difficult to understand that 50% are going to Ardenmore in that case. But in, in any case, the, um, the churches, we can write, we can appeal to them. And I would like to think that the churches would be sympathetic to people, that if council do go ahead with this, the churches would waive the charges as well. But I think that, and I think many of them would do that. It's been a fair, it's a very difficult one, Mayor, and one that we find ourselves torn on because we do want to reach out and to help people, but we are concerned about the amount of money that we will lose, or that people will lose, that could have been claimed as grants. Thank you. 
Thank you, Alderman uh, McClintock. Uh, Alderman Guy. Thank you, Mayor. Um, listen, I'm, I'm just going to. Uh, I know this is this is obviously a very sensitive issue. This, um, but uh, can they agree uh, with Councillor Carr and Councillor Gallagher in this? Um, at the start, I thought this was just going to be those who lost people through COVID, and and some of that is is regards the 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 department. You know, there's been figures bandied bandied about here regarding you know in some areas, eighty percent of funerals are are paid by the the department, and uh, you know the the issue of three hundred and fifty eight pound for the new grave, and one hundred and fifty eight pound for uh, a reopened. Brave. And there's some issues regarding the where, where we've said that we can sort of backdate it to people who have died before this proposal, you know, and then and the, the absence of any clarity from the department, i.e. see if we are going to pay for funerals or graves of people who've already had the grant, would the EFC uh, look for that money back? Would they, you know, would they try to recruit that? I also uh, am taking on board the issue of of people who have decided that they want to bury their loved one in in a church uh, graveyard, uh, and and it could send out a bit of a, a wrong message there. I do think that you know if this goes through, that the churches should pay for them graves. We that's beyond our control, but uh, I just think that this whole thing leaves more questions than it does answers and uh, I'm not sure if I, I can support this at this time. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Councillor Donnelly. Um, Councillor Harkin. Thanks, Mayor. Yeah, um, last week I, I uh, thought that this was a very, very good proposal and I, and I uh, agree with you that it is a humanitarian um, uh, and a humanitarian thing to do. We want to be with people who are grieving right now, and it's it's an extremely difficult time for people given the limitations on how uh, funerals are being conducted, and, and who knows when this is going to end. Um, but I, I think that the cost and then some of the issues that Councillor Carr and others have raised about the way it would be carried through, I definitely put question marks about um, how we would do it. Um, so I, I'm definitely not as sure right now that this makes sense for us as a council. Um, uh, Councillor Duffy says we should, councillors should carefully think through what they vote on this, and uh, I agree. And I don't think that this uh, should be an issue that gets politicised. Uh, people grieving and their bereavement, um, and um, so you know. Sometimes people talk about hard decisions, welfare reform, cutting NHS funding. Um, uh, this is no different uh, in some ways. And I suppose that um, I'm not sure if there's a demand from the people who are grieving that, that we do this. Um, I think if that was the case, uh, it, it would be an issue. But, you know, I think what Councillor uh, Guy just said about if we're in a situation where people go from being furloughed to, to say that the council's got no choice, but we need to lay people off, um, that's three jobs. Um, we're in a situation where we just had a discussion about confusion about whether or not uh, uh, people who are facing food poverty are being cut out from receiving food boxes. Um, so, you know, can can I get a bit more clarity? Because one, like, can people can access a grant. That would cover some of this cost and then it's an active discussion that this is something that we would be asking uh the department to take on and cover so can we can we get a bit more clarification on that because there was a seems to be a difference of opinion but if the if some of these costs are going to be um families would see some of these costs covered uh you know given given the dire straits that our council is the, the, the council report that we've just had and then you know uh, we've already had, had different people saying we're going to have to make hard decisions and a time of austerity um, like I, I think a bit more 
uh, if we get clarification on them two issues, the grant situation and whether or not it's an active discussion for the department to, to cover some of these costs, does that would make a big difference? Thank you. Through you, Chair, can I perhaps just give you our understanding in terms of the scheme? Um, and I, I think that having looked on it, um, officers uh, can uh, report that there is a, a support for people on specific benefits um, for uh, funeral expenses. Um, and this specifically mentions uh, burial charges. Um, so there's an overall um, support for the, the funeral charge for the funeral expenses. And then there is a and it was, uh, regardless of what councillors had said, you know, a lot of people had come to me and said, what can council do to alleviate the financial burden of the cost of funerals at this time? Um, you know, so I appreciate all of the comments made. I don't want to labour too much on the matter, uh, other than, you know, um, in terms of moving forward, and I get everybody is concerned about the repair here this afternoon. We've made some decisions in the past that you know, you could say there was injustices made to the ratepayers. So I think there needs to be a very open and frank conversation going forward in terms of uh, finance and, and 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 that and what we can do to save money for the ratepayers within our locality. Um, so you know, I'm happy to to take a vote on this um, this afternoon. I don't want to kind of labour um, uh, on everyone uh, in terms of what we need to do here. I I, I want to kind of. Finish the conversation. It was a proposal a couple of weeks ago. Uh, at that time, uh, everybody supported it last week. Uh, Listen to all the views and comments. Um, you know, uh, in terms of you know the, the fact that we're talking about job losses here, we need to retain jobs. You know, and there are other ways that we need to do that as a council too. We have to look at how we do our outside contracts. Can we bring them into the in-house to be done to save and retain jobs that would have good value and, and better outcomes for our ratepayers going forward. So, um, you know, I, I'll take this to a vote. Uh, Mayor, sorry, be, be, sorry, Mayor, just before you move to a vote, I had posted up a, a, an opportunity perhaps to come in and make a proposal. If you'll allow me to do that before you move to a vote. Uh, my, my proposal is quite straightforward. It's to accept the recommendation that was made in the paper with the caveat that we time limit it uh, for one month uh, until such time as we're back in committees uh, and we review it then at that point. But I think that uh, given my earlier comments, I, I'm still of the opinion that uh, that this is the right thing to do in circumstances whereby people are not able to attend the great site in the usual way. So burials are taking place in a way that people would normally understand. But I think that we can't have a situation where back cycle continues to prevent a waiving of the burial fee for a month in the future when that has been uh, restored to the situation. We can't attend the gravesite in the normal way. So I think. Sorry, sorry Martin. Uh, there's a bit of background noise there. I, I can't hear what you're saying. Sorry for coming on like that. Okay, will I try again, Mayor? Yeah, I think. Yeah, you were just breaking up there and, and parts, Martin. If you just want to kind of bring your. So the, the proposal is is that we waive the fees for the uh, for the burials for one month, and review it at the next relevant committee, which will be in June, uh, either Health and Communities or. Um, environment and regeneration, whichever is the relevant committee for this to be brought to, um, but that we we work on the basis as you, Mayor, had indicated at last week's full council that this would be a humanitarian and responsible way for the council to recognise that people are grieving, but not in the usual way, and that the removal of the burial fees at this time during lockdown is the right thing to do to show compassion. To our citizens, but that it is time bound and brings a degree of um, of financial prudence into the decision that we will review it um, uh, in a month's time and, and uh, on a monthly basis thereafter. That's that's my suggestion, Mayor, as a proposal. Thank you. I second that. 
Uh, I think that was John Boyle there seconded that. Um, uh, Councillor Riley, um, this, as I say, and I want to thank Karen for bringing forward the report. Um, you know, uh, uh, this is uh, Council Corporate's report in terms of a six month period, uh, and that is open. That was open for discussion. Um, I'm happy to have it reviewed. Um, you know, uh, monthly. Um, uh, as I say, I want to move on with it this afternoon. So uh, you've put the proposal to the floor, Councillor John Boyle has has seconded. So um, I'm happy to move forward on that proposal um, that we move um, to to vote on this matter this afternoon and have it reviewed. Uh, obviously, you know we, we are in a in a position where we are, uh, you know, relaxation from the from our, our our executive in terms of what can happen next and what phases they are in terms of moving forward with the next stage and phasing out and phasing in with different regulations. So um, I'm happy to take that this afternoon and um, move on uh, in terms of uh, voting uh, on that with that proposal included in it. Uh, so John, maybe just if you want to take um, a vote on that. I'm um, happy to do that, Mayor. Can I just clarify, Mayor, is it, is it one month from today? One month from the twenty eighth of March. Uh, no, from from the twenty eighth of March, including the burials, uh, the deaths of those who died of COVID prior to the twenty eighth of March, John. And I think members will agree with me on that. Happy to uh, give that clarification. Yeah. Can I have that again? Proposal again? Clarification. Is that you, Councillor Kerr? Yeah. I'm saying there were noises. Can I say any clarification again? The time frame and where? Uh, my proposal for you, Mayor, was that we we introduced the scheme as it had been outlined in the report, but that we time limited. Yes. Um, one month, and then review it at the next available committee, which will be in June. I'm not sure if it's going to come to housing communities or environment generation. Offices can clarify that, but it will be reviewed in June. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Ray, for that clarity. Um, hey, Madam Mayor, the clarity I was asking, John had asked when is the month start? Is starting from today or back to the 28th? No, That's I mean, are we doing it from a month now without looking back or what? No, I'm happy to include, as the paper said, from the 28th of March, although to include the deaths of COVID-19 within the city and district uh, for those who are buried in our graveyards uh, prior to the 28th of March. Um, can I take that? John? Can I come on there? I'm looking to come on. A new proposal. No, I'm not going to accept another proposal on this. I want to move forward with this now this afternoon. If have enough time on it, I have Councillor O'Reilly's proposal, Councillor Geller at this time and move on with it. I want you to speak on this proposal. Yeah. Okay. I'll hear the proposal. Well, I'm not making a new proposal. I'm saying on I want to speak on this proposal. Okay, Councillor Gallagher. And again it's round. We, we haven't had any clarification around uh, the grants and, and, and payments that you can't claim for a grant for a cost if this goes through you can't claim for a cost that you didn't uh, you didn't incur so we could be technically just saving the department money and, and, if, and if it's backdated people have already received a grant for for a uh, on a grave and buy a new grave and have received the money. Technically, there's a waiver that cost. The department could ask for that back. We are just asking the payers to pay for a cost that subs, uh, subvents uh, the cost to the department. So I think this decision hasn't been made at all. But the department could save £78,000. Seventy eight thousand pound. Uh, that right there, it's on like the cost. I, I appreciate all the 
where this was coming from. But the reality is, the council and the current crisis uh, and the current financial crisis has taken on another cost, a large amount, which is a department's cost. We shouldn't be doing it. Gallagher, a figure of £78,000. That, that is a figure over a six month period. We, we, we are reviewing this next month. Um, so it won't be £78,000. I'm happy to move on now with the vote. Um, so all Mayor, Mayor, see, just before you do move on, can we just clarify as well that not every family um, actually applies for a grant? So it's not a total that the department will save of £78,000 because not every family actually will apply for that grant. Absolutely, and I think uh, uh, Councillor um, Patricia Loke had said that also in the comments. Okay, members, um, all those in favour, um, John, are you ready to take a vote? Uh, yes, Mayor. Um, so, for, against, or abstain in relation to the proposal, I understand it uh, in line with the paper from the 28th of March up to at least ENR in June, uh, when it will be reviewed, um, and uh, also to include those who have sadly passed away uh, um, with COVID prior to the 20th of March and have been buried uh, in the council graveyard. So for or against or abstain, Alderman Breslin. John, there's an issue here with Alderman Breslin, but I have him on the phone to say for. Go ahead, Alan. <laughs> Did you hear that, John? I do. <laughs> well, okay, well, uh, yeah. Here, okay. Louder. Go ahead, Alan, again. Four, four, John. Okay. There you are. Thank you, Alderman Breslin. Uh, Alderman Devaney. Four. Alderman Guy. I'm stay upstaying. Alderman Kerrigan. I'll, I'll have to go far as well. Alderman McClintock. Four. Four. Thank you. Um, Alderman McCain. You there, Alderman McCain? Abstain. Thank you. Alderman Ramsey. Four. Alderman Councillor Jason Barr. Hi, John. Can you miss me out there? Uh, sorry, uh, is that Ryan? I had apologies it for him. Yes, John. I just okay. record four, please. Oh, yeah. Uh, Councillor Jason Barr. Jason, are you there? I don't think he's on the call, John. Okay. Uh, Councillor Raymond Barr. Raymond. I think Raymond's gone as well. Okay. Uh, Councillor John Boyle. Yeah, four. Thank you. Mayor, Councillor Michaela Boyle. Uh, four. Councillor Tina Burke. Four. Abstain. Councillor Cooper. Councillor Cooper's left, John. Okay. Councillor Cusick is not there, no? No. No. Councillor Dobbins on the line? Yes, John. Four. Four. Councillor Donnelly? Abstain. Councillor Duffy? Four. Councillor Durkin. Your son, four, John. Councillor Farrell. Four. Councillor Ferguson. Four. Councillor Fleming. Paul, are you still there? No. Nope. Right, was that Fleming? No, he's not. He's gone, John. Gone. Okay. Councillor Gallagher. Paul Gallagher. 
Uh, abstain, John. Abstain. Uh, I'm here, John uh, Hunter. Um, okay, Councillor Hunter, is it which way Four, you go? Please. Thank you. Thank you. I see Councillor Fleming coming in there saying. Um, just give me one second. Thank you. Councillor Harkin, I didn't catch yourself yeah. there. Abstain. Abstain. Thank you. Councillor Jackson. Four, John. Councillor Tony. Four, John. Councillor Logue. Four, John. Um, not Councillor McCann's on the line. No. Councillor McCluskey. Against John. Councillor McGuire, are you on the line? No. No, he's not on the line. <clears throat> Councillor McHugh. Four, John. McKeever. Councillor McKinney. Philip had to leave as well, John. Okay. McKinney. Four, John. Councillor Mellon. Any of you on the line? Name's gone. Oh. Councillor Riley? Four. Councillor Tierney? Four, John. Thank you. Mayor, I have 24, one against, and six abstentions. Thank you, John. Um, thanks. Thank you, everybody. Um, uh, as far as I'm aware, I've seen Councillor Donnelly had uh, nothing to do with the amendment, but understanding orders, John, correct me if I'm wrong, if the, uh, the motion is voted and passed, then there can be no going back on an amendment. Uh, no, once right. you've uh, once Provoke that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Thanks everyone um, for that. Uh, as I said, I do take on board everybody's comments and even those who may have a pecuniary interest or otherwise. But I, I just want to put on record my thanks to everyone um, for their um, attention to this uh, motion this afternoon. And um, thank you. Comment, please. Can I make a quick um, comment? Yeah, who's it? It's Councillor Donnelly. Gary, uh, I'm not finished speaking yet. Um, I'll, I'll... Um, I just want to thank everybody. Um, obviously, um, you know, I, I do appreciate the comments that have been made this afternoon. Uh, and um, I have never done, it's never been my intention to be reckless on any motion or proposal that I bring forward to council. Um, uh, so I, I want to thank those who supported um, the proposal this afternoon. Um, it will go in some way to deal with hardships for those who do apply for burial uh, support uh, and for those who don't, don't. So thank you everybody this afternoon for your comments um, in regard to, to the review of burial charges. Um, th and thanks to Karen for bringing forward the paper. Okay, members, um, I have no other business. Uh, that was agenda. Sorry, Councillor Donnelly, go ahead. Chair, for letting me in. Chair, just the, the amendment that I would have made that, that I can't would, would have just simply been something around that we contact the churches and that we ask the churches to adopt our position. And if the churches don't adopt that position, that the, those who wish to, who are buried in church uh, graveyards, could come to council and apply for the same rights as ratepayers as we were affording people in like the city centre. So I'm not sure, could I ask for a report to be done on that or is that feasible? Uh, I'm not sure, I would have to ask Karen, uh, but uh, just on uh, my comments earlier, uh, I did say that we would write out to the churches and ask them to follow follow um, what we are doing in regards to, to burial, even the burial phase. I'm not sure, Karen, maybe if you want to comment on that, if you're still- If I could. Maybe help with this. 
we, yes. we would be content tonight to write out to the churches um, and then perhaps dependent upon the responses, members may wish to consider the position at that stage. Yeah, happy to do that, John. Thank you. Okay, members, um, thank you for your indulgence this afternoon. And again, I just want to put on my thanks to everyone within the council staff and the council team for, for putting together the presentation this afternoon. And to you, John, um, for your um, continued support to your staff and to us as members and, and to everyone involved in the work that's ongoing. And uh, I want to send my support and solidarity to all of our frontline workers within our staff, to the team who are out and about every day, day and daily, the bit men, the street cleansers and, 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 and the workers for the great job that they're doing and, and, and during this pandemic. So thanks everyone for your indulgence this afternoon. And thanks to everyone who's participated from Council corporately um, this afternoon. And I want to put on record my thanks to Paul Jackson, who's here with me this afternoon and our press comms team. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mm-hmm.